Yo, what's good, everybody? I'm GG. You're tuned in to the Green Gorilla Channel. It's the place where black men can express themselves freely, straight up with no chases, man. Straight up. First thing I want to do is give a shout out to all the haters out there, man. How y'all doing, man? Hope y'all passing a good afternoon. Peace to you. You know what I'm saying? As you matriculate in, could you please hit the like button, man? Subscribe to the channel if you haven't and hit the bell notification button so you can stay on top of what's going on here on the Green Gorilla channel, man. And, uh, you know, like I always do, man, uh, I'm offering a clarion call for you guys to... What's good, everybody? Hold on, I'm the man. G with a PhD, and you're tuned in to the Green Gorilla channel. The Hold place on, man. where That's... black men can express themselves freely. That's the wrong thing. Hold on. <laughs> I hit the wrong button, man. But, uh... I'm 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 encouraging y'all to share the video, share man. Share the damn video, bitch. I'm in, I'm encouraging you to share the video, man. Got too much going on. But anyway, uh, like I always do, I want to give a shout out to all of the members of the Green Gorilla channel before I get started, and uh, all the Patreon members before I get started, and then I'm gonna get into it, man. So shout out to G Star, Hair Ruin the Apocalypse, Ted Gunderson, Outside the Cube, Gerard Shelton, Raise More G. Black men being brutally honest. Wild Bear 50, Sun Ra 44, and Barnola. Big up to them, man. Big up to No Sleep, BGS Ivmore, Jast, FA4L, Andre 416, Mantis on Break, Lock Vegas 05, Bimrock, Brotherly Love, Damien H, Passport OG, and Dr. Tia Sign Johnson. Big up. Big up to Rasheed Barnes, Blacksworth 404, Ben Cannon Kenton, Sherlin Woe, Leon 08, Artisan MC, Dub Will, Mr. Good Dad, Third Coast X, Roderick Jackson, Michael Ross, 63rd Samurai, and Divine Love Ridge. Big up. Big up to Ishmael Samad, The Watcher, Hostile Adept, The Ruthless Heartless Revelator, Kill the Gang, Dr. Thunder, Jason Hales, Charles Finney, Interesting Thought, and A Silent Warrior. Big up, man. Big up to Naomi Gary, J. Cleveland Green, the Black Toxic Masculinist, Pulpit 28, Larry R., Seth Sun, Afro Coop TV, Show Me Spain Man, Seventh Coast Dojo, Anthony Davis, I'm Just Jules in an Honest Look. Big up. <laughs> Big up to Ricky Dawson, Stefan, True 7360, Mr. Me Too, Call for President, Gold Professor, AKs and Curtains, H Town, Roguish to Bill Monker. And among, hold on, let me. <laughs> Thing keep moving up and down, man. It's killing me, man. Adrian Thomas, Electrician 480, Binga, Cutting Up with the Jones, Zanko 1, D Scott, Path Guy 74, Pete Rock 496, Aaron Peters, Vincent Lindsay, Quiz the Poet, Black Wizard, ADOS, and Shadow Observer. Big up, man. <laughs> Big up to Troy Warren, Mrs. KP Bailey, Alan Wiley, The Face, Life of Commerce, AI Apostle, Jeffrey Speed, Marvin Battle Jr., and Adam. Big up, man. <laughs> Big up to Ignatz Mouse, Dr. Tree, 77 Base X, Brian McMurray, K. Ryan S., Charles Rogers, Rick Ross, Sandra Jean, Charles Gilmore, Greg, and Barry Little. Big up, man. <laughs> also, shout out to Mr. Valentino, Cameron 87, Doc LaRock, Mark Swift, Odd Collard, Donald Watts, Coach Hotep, and Old Soul Chief. Big up, man. <laughs> Big up to Mr. Blue Collar, TD Hip Hop Media, Drew Main, Mr. Heat, Sir Anthony. Uh, ML Law, Universal 178, Aaron Smith, DHA Double, Kalanja Collar, and WPR1. <clears throat> and I can't forget the brethren on the Ethereal Plane, Force Windu, David Carroll, and Kevin Samuels. Big up, man. <laughs> also, I want to give a shout out to all the people that support me on Patreon Robert Wicks, Shine Language, Chris Flowers, Christopher Burton, Daxby the Tetrahedron, J Live. Rashawn Phillips Sewells, Keith Bass, Nick, Albert C., Dr. Ben Vincent, Jay Cleveland Green, I'm the Light of My Father, Waffle Weave, Darnell Smith, Excalibur, Pursuer Prisoner, Taz, Dragon 59, Jay Bailey, Mr. Michi, Mo Mal, and the Sangua, man. Thank y'all, man. I appreciate your support, man. <laughs> Thank you so much for your support, man. I really appreciate it, man. And if you're interested in becoming a member of the Green Gorilla channel, this small, little bitty, micro influencer channel, man, here's how you do it, man. What's good, everybody? I'm the G with a PhD, and you're tuned in to the Green Gorilla channel, the place where black men can express themselves freely. Straight up, no chaser.
Today, I want to introduce you to my new membership program that consists of five levels where you can invest in the Green Gorilla channel on a monthly basis and receive level specific perks. Memberships are special because they improve the quality of the content of the channel and will help me to be able to keep the channel going. Now to participate in the Green Gorilla Channel membership program, all you have to do is hit the join button, which is located right next to the subscribe button on my channel page. Now for all of my subscribers who decide not to participate in my membership program, nothing will change. The content will keep coming the way it always has. Thanks for watching and be careful out here, people. Bless. All right, man. What's cracking with y'all, man? I'm Gigi. Of course, you're tuned in to the Green Gorilla Channel. It's the place where black men can express themselves freely. Straight up with no chases, man. I mean, you can say whatever you want to say, you know. Uh, that's how I perceive space that I created. I can't speak for others and what they say and how they go, you know, about what they do and how they get down. But this is how I get down in my space. You can say what you want to say. You can express yourself freely. You don't have to be worried about being called a bussy. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> you ain't got to be you ain't got to be worried about being called some sort of derogatory name. On the account that you're expressing yourself, you ain't got to worry about that. You don't have to be worried about being called a bitch ass nigga unless you you, you know you're doing some bitch ass shit. Because if you're on some bitch-ass type of time, man, you know, man, I'm from the trap for real, man. I'm, you know, it just is what it is. I ain't saying I'm the hardcore dude out here in the, on the planet. Never did say that. Never ain't going to say that I ain't got my ass whipped on occasions. It has happened. But I'm from the trap. I'm from Northside St. Louis, Kossuth and Fair. Motherfuckers will pop your ass with pistols out there, boy. <laughs> Real talk, I'm just keeping it a buck, man. I am not playing games, man. Motherfuckers will hurt your ass for talking disrespectful and reckless. Real talk. Won't, won't even get loud with you about the shit. Okay, that's the type of time you on? Okay, we'll be back. <laughs> I might not even have to come back. Just is what it is. But uh, before I get started, man, I want to say shout out to Salty Balls, man. Shout out to him, man. What's up with you, Salty Balls? Says scroll of Unix to... Three, thine eunuchs are devoid of foundation, a backbone, a keystone, for they have become its receivers, recipients, catchers, vessels for all the poison that the sheathen pours into them. <laughs> Shout out to Salty Balls, man. Shout out to Barry Little. He says, hit the like button on the way in if you haven't already. If not, why not? Support your scholars. Support independent black male media. Straight up. Thank you, sir. Got another one from Salty Balls. He says, scroll of Unix, chapter 2, verse 4. Thus devoid of all living essence that emanates from the loins, these broken men are only fed by the destruction and consumption of thinking men into their fray. Shout out to him again. <laughs> Boy, you have a way with words, my friend. And Jastek, shout out to Jastek. He says, black manosphere team up two of the Infinity Stones. GG and Dr. T. So, yeah, you know, we're we going in. We might have a third here today. Uh, I sent, you know, uh, I, sent, I sent the link in the uh, email, you know what I'm saying? So uh, those persons who I'm talking about, man, they know I'm not going to put them on the spot, you know, uh, in case they, you know, are tired and don't want to uh, get down. But if you, if, you, if you feel like getting down, I left the link in the email. So uh, having said all that, um, Preliminary remarks, man. Um, just so it could be known, right? Before I even get started, because I, I feel like it's necessary before I even broach the subject, which, which today is black culture being connected to concubine culture. Uh, and I dare after we go through this for anybody to say that that's a lie. I dare you. I dare you. My man, uh, M. Lavo says, what you know about St. Charles Rock Road? 
I miss the loot. Let's cook, sir. Shit, I know all about St. St. Charles Rock Road. Yes, sir. Know a lot about St. Charles Rock Road. North County. Not really North. I can't really call it North County, but it's close. It's close. Uh, it's the county, though. I, I'm from the city, though. You know what I'm saying? So going to St. Charles Rock Road, man, it's going where them white folks at, man. <laughs> it's going where them white folks at. But anyway, uh, before I even get into this, man, I just want to say, look, have you ever heard someone say, you chose your partner. So you get what you deserve. You ever heard that? Have you ever heard of that? You chose your partner, you get what you deserve. Have you ever heard that? Now to me, this argument is basically used to blame people for the actions of their partners, man. And I'm gonna debunk that just before I even start because I think it's a problematic argument and there are logical fallacies connected to it. Okay, the first fallacy is victim blaming, man. <laughs> so imagine that you got a guy, for the sake of argument, we'll call him Alex, who gets cheated on his, you know, cheated on by his partner, call her Keisha. Some people will argue that since Alex chose Keisha as a partner, they deserve to be cheated on. Now, I don't understand who creates this kind of thinking, you know, th th these kind of logics. I, I, I don't understand them. But anyway, it's problematic because it places the onus for Keisha's actions on Alex. Now, tell me how the fuck that's fair, man. <laughs> I, want you to, I want you to explain to me through a logical argument how... Another individual's actions, a person who can choose, a person who has autonomy and freedom, how their actions are something you're responsible for. You can blame me for somebody else's actions. Each person is responsible for their own actions, and Keisha's decision to cheat is her own. And it's important for people to understand. I don't know if you've ever been with a partner. I don't know if you've ever had a woman or a significant other. But one thing you got to know when you're dealing with a whole entire different person is that you cannot predict or control all of the actions of your partner. You cannot predict the actions of your partner, man. Not all of them. You may be able to, you know, based upon your previous experience, kind of forecast some of what somebody else might do, but you could not predict what somebody else is going to do. It's impossible, man. A lot of people can't predict what they will do, let alone what another individual will do. I'm, I'm telling you, my uncle used to say this all the time. You ever sat on the toilet and tried to take a shit, but you couldn't? Or did you ever fart and thought you was just only farting, but you accidentally shit yourself? Well, if you can't trust your own ass, who can you trust? Who can you trust, man? <laughs> the next phase, the next thing is hindsight bias. It's a fallacy. And hindsight bias basically involves believing that past events were more predictable than they actually were. Like you some sort of, you know, precog or some shit like that. For instance, someone might argue, going back to our example, that Alex should have known that Keisha would cheat because he ought to be able to see the signs. And this assumes that the signs of cheating, if there are any, are clear. And that Alex should have predicted this outcome. And the same goes for women. It, it, it could be like this doesn't have to just be a situation in which a woman is doing the cheating. It could be a man as well. Okay, so this is not sex specific. Okay. But it's important for people to understand and recognize that it's easy to spot signs 
after the fact when you already know the outcome. That's why they say hindsight is 2020. What? So, before Keisha cheated, those signs might have been ambiguous or they might be non-existent. So we should be cautious about assuming that we can predict the future based on past behaviors. Okay? And also, another error is what I call the just world fallacy. That we have a just world that we live in. It's based on the idea that we get what we deserve in life. The good things happen to good people, bad things happen to bad people, and that's just the way that it is. And some might argue, well, Alex must have done something to deserve getting his wife or getting his girlfriend, Keisha, piped down. <laughs> oh, you were weak. But the reality, man, is life often is not fair. And people don't always get what they deserve, nor do they always get what they merit. And there's a difference between uh, dessert or what people deserve and merit. It's a difference, but I'm not going to get into that philosophical distinction at the current moment. Okay. But the reality is that good people can experience bad things and vice versa. Bad people can experience good things. Okay. So Keisha cheating on Alex doesn't mean that Alex deserved it or that he did something to cause it. I'm just tired of hearing, like, there are a lot of people who profess to be super intelligent and to use logic, but I, I just don't see how a lot of people are employing logic in these spaces on YouTube. I just don't. And uh, before I even move forward, man, let me acknowledge the presence of my brother here, man. What's up with you, Dr. Johnson? What's, what's good with you, man? You chilling? Oh, yeah, man. Just uh, getting it in. Uh, appreciate the invitation. You know, good to come up and, uh, and and dialogue with my brother. Hey, man, glad to have you, man. It's been a while since we chopped it up on the same platform, man. In real you know. talk. You know, uh, I was going to get down with you uh, when you were having a discussion about uh, po the power, I think it was. <laughs> but I didn't have any, I, I hadn't seen enough episodes to actually chime in and to make, uh, you know, a substantive contribution. So I said, let me chill on out. Oh, I wish you would have, man. <laughs> you know, I, even, I you know I should have came in and just laid the hammer down, huh? Well, yeah. Well, even just responding to because we were trying to do an overview of the story for people because we know not a lot of brothers watch that series, and I ain't mad about it. But I just wanted brothers to know what that was, so we were doing an overview, and I was like, man, Gigi gonna tear this up as soon as he hears what happened. Anyway. Bro, man, bro, when I saw that last episode of that shit, man, I fucking flipped my lid. I say they all need to be burned to hell, man. <laughs> Yeah, man. <laughs> I was like, what the fuck? Is, man, this is crazy. And brother, it, it went from there, man. Brothers are trying to get me to go watch Barbie. I'm like, I'm really not trying to go see Barbie, y'all. Come on now. Man, I, bro. Ain't no way in hell I'm about to go see Barbie, bro. I just the same. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, if, if somebody paid me to go do it. But I mean, in, in essence, though, by, by reviewing it, you will get paid for having done it, though. I know, but I just don't want to see that shit. That's all. <laughs> <laughs> hey, man, subdue your passions, man. Subdue your passions, man. <laughs> lay, lay your emotions to the side, man. <laughs> I don't know if I got the energy, man. I don't but, know. But, but before, I'm, I'm going over these fallacies, man, related to people uh, who consistently... Talk about like people getting what they deserve by attributing blame, not to the person who's actually experiencing some sort of injustice, but on the character of the person who's being subjected to injustice. It's as if, you know, like if, if something bad happens to you, you are a bitch ass nigga and you deserve for it to happen. Right. Right. Come on, man. This is the, this the level of thought the people are, are working with on YouTube? Like, I mean, is this the sophisticated dialogue and the kind of, you know, thought processes 
that like is popular on social media because it's it's fucking garbage. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's garbage. Yeah, this is what we get. I mean, Umar wasn't too far from that when he made his last statement, right, about black men and black women, and ultimately, uh, you know, in essence, black men get what they get, you know, because uh, they're they're somehow responsible for her behavior. It, but that that logic of always bringing it back and making it about you know, especially black men, seems to be real consistent and popular. Well, it, to me, what it is, it's, it's a series of errors in judgment and a series of logical errors that are utilized to make these kind of arguments. I mean, first and foremost, look, people who are autonomous and who can make choices, mm-hmm. they have to be culpable and responsible for the, co- the, the choices they make outside of the context of implicating anybody else. Male or female. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, where, you know, you can make the case that, you know, well, w- women only respond to men or one particular woman is only responding to a man, but that's treating this woman as if she's a passive object that only can do things in order to, you know, counter what somebody else has done. Yeah. That just, just it removes all agency from women. And it doesn't help that you have women that participate in that when it's convenient. That's that's part of the problem. When it's not convenient, they're independent. When it's convenient, they're quiet and they're willing to assume. And, you know, a lot of that, a lot of what you're describing. So that makes it even more complicated because you end up advocating for her, her independence and agency as a human being. And she can be relatively quiet when it suits her. So it, it, it just makes it that much more complicated. My whole thing is, look. If we go, if we gonna do this equality thing and this freedom thing and this responsibility thing, we gotta open the floodgates all the way up. You can't just be selective and pick and choose and cherry pick when you're gonna be responsible and when you're gonna be, you know, a faint and couch feminist and all this kind of shit. That didn't, don't work for me, man. You can't, right. you can't oscillate back and forth between I'm woman, hear me roar, and oh my god, I can't handle it. <laughs> no, uh, uh-uh. uh, don't. That dog ain't hunting with me. But anyway, getting back to what I was doing before I forget, um, the other fallacy is what I call, and this is number four. As you, if, if you can retrace my steps, you'll see that I've already presented three fallacies. The just world fallacy, the hindsight ba- uh, bias fallacy, and the victim blaming fallacy. The fourth fallacy is what I call fundamental attribution error. And it's the tendency to attribute others' behavior to their character rather than situational factors. So in this case, someone might argue that Alex picked the cheater because they have poor judgment. You hear this shit all the time. Oh, yeah. Su- suggesting that it's a character flaw. It's, it, it's superhero level at this point where you're supposed to see red flags, you know, in some kind of magical way. But when you look at the divorce rates, there's a whole lot of people not seeing red flags. But that somehow becomes a failure, especially of men, rather than really looking at the way uh, systemically women are incentivized to manipulate, to operate on their path as far as family court and so on and so forth. So if you have a culture of people who've been taught by multiple generations of older women how to navigate men and use the system for their advantage, why would you be surprised that so many people are, are, are confused and tricked about a woman's behavior, right? But right. for some reason, that just becomes his inability to read red flags. And that's coming from the manosphere. That's not even coming from feminists. That's coming from men in the same space, many of whom got divorced or cheated on themselves. Man, they want you to be omnipotent, omniscient, and omnibenevolent. That's the sort of shit motherfuckers want you to be Superman. Exactly. And and, in many instances, it's a lot of these motherfuckers around here want you to be motherfucking Captain Saber Ho, too. But I ain't gonna even speak on that. Let me stop. (laughs) So... But, but the, the point is, is the fundamental attribution era uh, argument is that if you, you, if you pick somebody that does something bad, like a friend or a partner, that it's all because of your poor judgment that that is happening to you, that they've done, they've done what they've done. You should have the uh, ability to discern who is of moral stand, you know, moral upright standing prior to, you know, having, you know, been exposed to them doing some shit that's unscrupulous, which is, is, 
it's an impossible standard, okay? Mm-hmm. Now, the kind of argument is that Alex's choice could have been influenced by a whole bunch of external factors. Right. Such as Jamie's, or in this case, Keisha, her deceptive behavior, societal pressures, or a lack of experience in identifying trustworthy partners. It's not fair to attribute the entire situation to a supposed flaw in Alex's character. It could be some shit. Keisha's just a fucking shithole. She done, she's done this a hundred times before. She's a scammer or some shit. Like, okay, so if you get scammed, it's your fault. Because <laughs> you, you shouldn't have been so gullible. Let me ask you a question, though. What, what happens when you have two people who, who are, we're going to assume are adults of adult age who have never, never seen a functional relationship in their life? If the closest me. they've ever come to a functional relationship is seeing two, two folks sitting on a bus for 30 minutes who are married for 30, 40 years, if that's the most you've seen in terms of a functional relationship, you haven't even seen the internals of that. You don't know how to argue in a functional relationship, or I should say disagree. You know what I mean? You don't know how to solve problems. You don't know how to put out fires, as it were. You don't know how to do any of those things that that constitute a functional relationship. If you've never seen one, or at worst, you've seen nothing but dysfunctional relationships, could that be a reason why Keisha cheated? Could that be a reason why, you know, these things may have happened to you more than once? I mean, at the end of the day, I'm saying there are other factors involved other than he just failed to see red flag. You know what I mean? It's just, it's ridiculous, man. Look, man, I believe in men taking responsibility for things, man. But what I don't believe in is that you're responsible for everything at all times in every situation. And that exactly. all, all this shit is to me is alpha talk, bro. Mm-hmm. It's a crass form of alpha talk. And the reason yesterday I did a show having a discussion about alpha shit and the myth and where it came from, it came from ethologists, okay? It came from people who study animal behavior, okay? And the first person to, you know, make the argument was Rudolf Schenkel and another person after him, David Meck, okay? And they studied wolves in captivity and they attributed a certain set of behaviors amongst wolves, uh, you know, to you know them in a natural setting, but it wasn't a natural setting because they studied wolves in captivity and they put them in situations of scarcity. And so, I mean, when you put any group of organisms together in a situation of scarcity, they're going to compete for the scarce resources. That's, I mean, this is just how fucking nature operates. Okay, but I mean, ultimately, David Meck, who felt responsible for proliferating this kind of uh, you know this, this argument came and cleaned it up. But he said, by the time, you know, I I had learned different, there were already hundreds of thousands of books out there matriculating through the public. And, you know, it was difficult for me to put the genie back in the bottle after, you know, it had been, you know, let out. It was difficult for me to put Pandora, you know, whatever the Pandora's box contained back in it. Okay. Um, But the problem is, is that this kind of, argumentation about like how to you know be dominant and how to be aggressive and assertive and all of this kind of shit it got into the business world and then it moved from the business world into the dating world okay and i think it's still there it's it's still there it's morphed into something different but i think it's still there okay Mm -hmm. and it's just it's based on bad argumentation (laughs) it's based on bad science from the fucking 70s man (laughs) <laughs> Come on, man. We still, we using 70s science? This, the, the people who proliferated the theorization have already retracted. Mm. But we gonna still push it, though. Oh, yeah. And yeah. I'm, but I'm just saying, like, to me, that's why you gotta be careful who you consume on social media, man, because a lot of these guys purport to be intelligent. They, they purport to have all the facts together. They purport to know more than what they actually know. And then, then it leads, you know, to, I don't know. Uh, to me, it just leads to the proliferation of misinformation. That's just how I perceive it, okay? But, you know, we also have to add to that, that YouTube, and you understand this, you know, better than most, you know, coming out of academia. YouTube is an entertainment space. So when you're trying to do an analysis of what's going on and you're on a, in a medium that 
predicates that prioritizes entertainment. And, and on top of that, the, with that chest thump, you know, alpha shit you talking about is entertaining, right? When you mix all that together, you're always going to find that, you know, the analysis always ends up being, you know, secondary to what's entertaining. And that's kind of that's kind of one of the difficulties we're facing, trying to have real conversations, but in a, on a platform that people come to to be entertained. Yeah, that's that's a it's a problem, but we do we do the best we can. I think we do a pretty good do- a pretty good job. At it, man. Given the circumstances, I think we do a pretty good job of it, man. You gotta have you have to find a balance and just hope it works for you. But you know, at the end of the day. You know, there, there's, there's a consistency with the channels that get over five hundred thousand subs, a million subs. It, you got to take entertainment into, into, uh, into account. Yeah, a- you got to, you got to become a spectacle, man. You know, uh, I have no interest in becoming a spectacle at the present moment. Maybe one day I will, but at, at the current moment, it's not about you know presenting a spectacle. It's just about telling the fucking truth, man. But which right. brings me to the last truth, okay? This whole notion. About, you know, like, it's all your fault. It's a false dichotomy because it assumes that there are only two outcomes based on the choice of, like, say, for in this instance, we're talking about selecting a partner, right? Either they're perfect and you're happy or they're flawed and you deserve the consequences, (laughs) right? And the reality is their relationships exist on a spectrum, man, with a whole host of possible outcomes, Okay. You can be cool one minute and it ain't cool the next. Okay? You can meet somebody and they're fucking happy as punch one day and then like two, three years down the line, it's a it's an issue. They might be depressed or have some emotive shit going on or psychological shit going on. Right? That makes them difficult to deal with. And I tell people, man, the woman you fuck with when you first met her ain't the same woman you, you fuck with when you got a baby with her or the same woman, you know, like if you divorce her, two different people, man, because you're not the same. Man, please. I was with I was with my wife for 11 years. We were married nine of that. The two people that met at the beginning of that and the two people that, you know, were, were dealing with each other toward the end, wholly different situation. Now, wholly. let me just say this. So, so I do want to I do want to um, I want to respond to it. Say it's not necessarily your fault, but it is your choice. And look, the question, the thing we're putting out here is this. If you choose to fuck with somebody, if you choose to have a partner, how responsible are you for everything that they do? That's the question we're, 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 we're presenting here. Everything that somebody else does is not your fault. And it's not even your choice. If you choose to fuck with somebody, you do choose the possibility that they might, you know, behave inappropriately or do something to violate your trust. But I mean, fuck. So what what are you going to do? Not fuck with anybody? You're not going to fuck with nobody? No, that's a choice. That's a choice you can make. But in my viewpoint, not fucking with anybody at all it's tantamount to being an ostrich, man, taking your head and burying it in the sand, right? Or becoming a monk. Which, I, you know, if that's what you want to do, I'm right. saying, like, I, I I personally am a monk right now. I, I don't already, I got two kids, man. They both grown. Mm. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? Ain't none of them under 20. Mm. I'm not, I definitely ain't about to go through this shit again. I can tell you that. <laughs> I can guarantee you, I'm not going through that shit again. Got a motherfucker <laughs> pregnant and shit. You running around trying to make sure they're okay. All that shit. <laughs> then you got to worry about waking up in the middle of the night. Motherfucker, little, little creatures crying and shit. She mad because you ain't got titties. You can't breastfeed the kid. I'm not going through that shit no more. <laughs> Uh huh. And look, I, I want to respond to this as well. And this is Maggie Thompson under the veil. <laughs> let me just say this. She says, "Let let people show you who they are. Uh, you choose to stay or go. How they respond to your feedback tells you a lot, which which is true. I mean, you know, my 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 viewpoint on it is, uh, you know, 
and welcome BGS. What's cracking with you, bro? Hey, what's going on? Man, what's, what's happening happen? with you, man? But hey, I, I just want to respond to this claim, though, before you start talking. So, okay. um, nobody's perfect in a relationship, man. Like, I mean, unless you walking around the planet thinking you're perfect. And people make mistakes. And people do fucked up shit. Like, I'll be the first to admit, I've done some fucked up shit. But not intentionally. It's not like I'm running around, you know, like, I'm trying to, I got a wife, but I'm seeing how many, you know, extracurricular chicks I can fuck or something like that. That's, uh, all I'm saying is, nobody's perfect, man. Everybody has different, like, attitudes and feelings and dispositions and personalities. And, you know, it's your choice if you're going to stick to it. But here's the thing that fucks me up, right? If it's easy for you to walk away, then what's the value of the, the relationship anyway? If, it, if, if it's just predicated upon hedonism and a sense of euphoria all day, every day, then what's the fucking use of it? That's just a, that's a rhetorical question. I mean, you can answer it if you want to. You don't have to answer it if you don't want to. But at the end of the day, there is no perfect partner because there are no perfect people. You just you end up having to measure, you know, how much you, you choose to tolerate once as as Maggie put it, you know, once you, you, you had a chance to see who they are, you just ask yourself, is this within the realm of what I, I'll deal with? And, it, you know, it really comes down to that. But anybody can act completely out of pocket on a whole nother level at any point you know so just you you you, you might have to develop a walk away game you know uh and keep it uh keep it strong because you never know how, how much it may hurt you might need to walk even after you, 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 you vetted her is yeah. what it is well hell most people don't even know who they are much less than who the other person is mm. so how do you expect people especially you know especially people under 30 i would say under 35 to figure this stuff out uh, they're not 90 years old and lived through like uh, a dozen relationships and had like you know multiple sets of children they haven't okay they don't even know who they are they can't figure this stuff that's how that's how come partners don't work i've been saying that since the 90s partners do not work you, marriage is a framework for two people that actually exist in and grow in okay without that framework then they have to depend on each other and each other's personalities and that's disaster mm. they don't even know who they are much less who the other person is mm. and that per and that person has to mature like like most guys don't really uh, uh psychologically mature till they get 40 years old they don't how, how's a 20 year old guy 25 year old guy 30 year old guy that, that's married with a woman gonna figure her out he can't that's why framework matters okay that's why husband and wife had a framework and duties where they're trained to exist inside a framework so the personality didn't matter that much as much okay if she, if she was had problems he had problems they could work it out within that framework when they don't have that framework guess what happens then they have to depend on each other's personality to blend and that's the recipe for what disaster that's how a marriage doesn't work anymore and then you give them a chance to actually get out of it on top of that to bail out that's why the average marriage is eight years average black marriage is five years Right, and it's my viewpoint on it is, is everything is but in this culture it's a microwave culture, man. It's hedonism, yeah. and it's it's all predicated upon like how satisfied you are at the time. And look, let, let's just be frank about this shit, man. I'm, I'm just gonna keep it real, right? Mm -hmm. Like people know how to hold grudges, and black women are like some experts at fucking holding on to grudges, man. But I mean, white women too. I mean, the whole point is if you're a woman, a woman in this culture, you can walk away holding a grudge with a great deal of power. It's just a fact. You can walk away with the kids and get half the resources. Okay? Because of the best interest of the child. Okay? And we already know what the best interest of the child is, right? <laughs> to be with their mom in the formative years of their lives. It's just a fact, man. What's so critical about what you just said, though, is even if you got basically what you said was even if you got a dude that has a problem with holding grudges, her grudges can be backed by institutional power. Your grudges are just your grudges. Right. That's one of the critical differences. This is why you have people. I've seen this, too. I've had I've partners that got divorced. Everything was cool. As soon as she saw him have a girlfriend. 
she would actually go back to court and start making demands, not because she needed it, not because there was a financial change in her life, but because she was she wanted revenge, even though they were divorced. But she had the power to use the court to push her revenge. And he just had to deal with it. That's a critical difference. Yeah, that's a, that's a hell of a difference. And it like you don't learn this until you you undergo this. I mean, people can t- tell you about this and talk to you and tell you, you know, and you can look from a distance and say, oh, that's fucked up. But until you really actually experience it, man, it's a, it's a hell of a thing to undergo parental alienation, man. <laughs> it's a hell of a thing to deal with, okay? Been there and done that. 30 years ago, went through that shit and did that, okay? Went through the father support system, you know, that existed in the city of St. Louis and, you know, went to the father support center. I was actually, you know, part of the first program where they were drawing up co-parenting agreements. Mm-hmm. First one, I'm the prototype, my case. And guess what? That chick didn't follow that shit because it was voluntary. It wasn't something that was court back. It was, you know, something that was established and set up by a community agency. But the whole point is I went to court and the chick did the same shit. And then you got to ask yourself the question, like at the end of the day, man, so, like, what if she violates the court order? So, what you gonna do? Call the police and have her arrested? They ain't gonna arrest her ass, bro. It's not gonna happen. Nope. <laughs> All you can do is say she didn't do X, Y, and Z. Okay, we'll note that. Okay, because they don't want to get involved in that shit. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, you know, uh, spare all the rhetoric. But then motherfuckers like, you know, like the amazing Lucas. We'll say some shit like, or all you alpha motherfuckers out there will say, it's your fault you picked her. You should have known that she was going to do this. Or you should have seen that this could happen. Or the only reason it happened was, was because you was a bitch ass nigga. (laughs) This is the amount of sophistication that we have. Yeah. This is the kind of fucking mind state that people are working with and operating with in contemporary popular culture. So where's his receipts, though? That's what I would ask. If you said if if you're good at it, demonstrate it. Um, and look, let me let me, bro, let me just say this shit, right? Mm-hmm. I'm a member of a Greek or you know letter organization, the Q's, mm-hmm. and you know, like I'm I am a Mason. So some people say I'm the Illuminati, which to me is absurd. But okay, whatever. Um, but if I'm with a group of men and we're sitting around talking, right? Mm-hmm. And some motherfucker who doesn't know us comes up and I don't care if he's fucking a politician, if he's a gangster, I don't give a fuck if this motherfucker is an angel <laughs> that descended from the celestial realm. What the fuck are you doing, man, in our mix, interrupting our conversation and then while you're doing it, being disrespectful, man? What the fuck is that about? And you know what I'm talking about. Talking about your, your the amazing Lucas guy. Okay? Because I basically was having a conversation with you. Yes. Not him. Mm-hmm. He wasn't like a part of the conversation at all. But he decided that he just had to fucking jump in. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like it was double dutch. And he just saw the ropes moving up and down, up and down. He just had to jump his ass in there. Mm-hmm. And instead of jumping in and being respectful, he decided to jump in and to try to put his dick on the tape, like you said. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Bro, I swear to God, man, if we would have been in, in real life and you would have done some shit like that, your ass would have been beat the fuck down, bro. I'm just keeping in the buck, man. No. I'm just keeping, I'm keeping, I'm not, I don't speak for anybody else on this panel, but I'm saying, bro, it's a way that you conduct yourself. I can tell guys that really actually, fuck all that alpha talk, guys who actually been around men, I can tell. And I can tell guys who just like have like a media presence and shit like that, because there's certain things that men do when they're around other men and certain things that they don't do if they're regularly around men. If you got a beef, if you got an objection to raise, if you got a problem, you fucking present the problem in a dignified fashion where you can reciprocate ideas. You don't just come out acting like 
you know, you run the fucking joint when you come in somebody else's house, man. You don't do that. I know I don't do that. That's not how I get down. I don't come to other people's platforms and start trying to put my dick on the table or putting my feet on the couch and shit. Not yeah. my feet. It's one thing that if you take off your shoes and shit, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and they tell you, relax a bit. You taking, you got your shoes on, you standing in the club, like you you paid for the motherfucking the VIP in the bitch. That's what pissed me off about it. And and the whole point, the the argument started. He got, I think he, you know, he got hot and bothered by me saying that black culture is concubine culture, man. Okay. That's what got him set off and ticked off. Okay? Like, what are you talking about? Is that like individual or is that like, you know, uh collective? Like, what do you mean? And what did you say? Well, it, it's a it's a bit of both. Yeah. <laughs> like it, it this is. thing it it matriculates between interpersonal or subjective relationships and structural conditions. Mhm. Or institutional conditions which have an impact of course on individual or subjective behavior. Uh, duh. <laughs> but the whole point is and this is the argument that these guys are making, man. The so-called alpha guys. They don't get treated like shit at all. Because why? Because they're just so fucking manly and... <laughs> they're such a... Di- I'm such a dude. <laughs> let, me, let me interject this much. And, and I don't want to go off on a tangent. I'm going to stay with this. But I'm just going to put this on the table for a little bit. A lot of that shit goes back to what we were talking about a minute ago in terms of YouTube being an entertainment space. Right. This dude, I mean, being coming in and saying I'm more alpha than everybody on the panel, that's a way to get attention. That's a way to get likes and clicks and views. Mm -hmm. But then when you actually look at it, because I was talking to BGS about that, I looked at Amazing Lucas, and I kind of remember seeing some of his videos here and there. This guy got over 405,000 subs. But when you look at his actual view counts on his videos, I got 35,000 subs. He has around the same number of views I do. Yeah. And he's doing 10 hour streams on disagreement days. So I'm looking at this like, you know, some of this may have been motivated um, by his disagreement. But to me, a good portion of this is motivated by a desperate need to give views. Yeah. Yeah. Because if your money. View counts are matching with people that got, you know, 10 percent of what you got in terms of subscribers, something else is going on. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm not saying we should take the whole discussion there. I just wanted to put that on the table. Yeah. Sometimes this entertainment space influences how these discussions go. Because people are, are eating off of this and they go with what's entertaining. And entertaining is either beef uh, or, or especially in our space, or, right. or fighting with women. Right. Okay. And let me just say this. I want to respond to this real quick. Mm-hmm. Look, and, and look I, I don't mind. Like, I, I love trolls. So let me just say this, man. Look, lady, tell Lucas to bring his ass here. That's all I'm saying. Tell Lucas to bring his bitch ass here. I'm saying it. Nobody else on the panel saying I'm saying it. Tell him bring his ass here. Yeah. Or either yeah. get off his dick. Tell him to manifest like a man and act like a man when he's in the presence of other men. All that bussy language and shit to me is some bitch made language, if you ask me. Yeah. It's I never heard, language. like, I, I'm from the trap. I've been alive for a long time and I ain't never heard grown ass men talk about calling each other bussies and shit. That's some gay language, man. That's gay, gay language. Yeah, it That's sure is. gay language, man. I don't give a fuck if Tariq Nasheed used the shit or not. It's still some gay ass language. <laughs> it is what it is. Tell that nigga to bring his ass here. <laughs> I bet you the nigga won't come. I bet you he won't pop the fuck up. And if you hear any lies, I want you to point out the lies that you hear here. I want you to stay here as an agent of chaos so that you can hear what's being articulated and you pinpoint, you tell me exactly what lie you hear. So having said that, don't flag them. Don't flag, don't get rid of this individual. I want them to be able to chime in on where they hear a deviation from the path of rectitude. Or when candor is somehow put in the back burner in service of spreading falsehoods. I want you to be able to state exactly 
wherein we're having this argument that there is some sort of misrepresentation or misinformation being presented. So I said it, I mean it, I meant it, I still mean it. I'm saying that black culture in and of itself is born out of slavery, is it not? Yes, it is. In America. Mm -hmm. Not saying it's born out of slavery in certain portions of Africa, because it, it may not have been, you know, born out of slavery in, say, for example, Ethiopia, if they call themselves black. Or the Sudan, maybe perhaps if they call themselves black, related to European slavery, because the, the Arab slave trade did exist in Northern Africa, okay? Yeah. Now, what I am going to say is, we're talking about the unique conditions that obtain in African American or black, or if you want to go back, Negro, or before that, colored culture. Mm hmm. Was it or was it not slave culture? Yes, it was. Uh -huh. Yes, it was. 100% created by, by the slave master. Okay. So, on a plantation, if you are a man who is black or a Negro or a colored, <laughs> however you want to, do you have control over family life? Or not? Do you or do you not have control over family life? No. No. You do not. As a woman on a plantation, do you or do you not have control over family life? More than a man. More than a man because ultimately, who has control over family life on the plantation though? The, uh, the master. The Massa and Miss Ann. Miss That's Ann. the facts, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Now tell me that's a lie. I want someone to tell me that there's an error in judgment of what's being said here. Now, one could argue that you don't like how it's labeled. You don't like the candor. You don't like the frankness. You don't like the, the you know, me putting the shit out there without, you know, kind of making it politically correct. I just put it out there for what it is. I want somebody to dispute it. <laughs> That's all I'm asking for. Dispute it. Tell me how it's the case that it's anything other than a concubine culture. And why do I say concubine? What is the definition of a concubine? It's a woman who stays with a man or subjected to the rule of a man who isn't married to the man mm -hmm. but plays second fiddle to the wife. Yes. Right? Yes. No formal, no legal connection, but she relies on that man for sustenance. Correct? Right. right. She's there for sex and children. Mm. Now, tell me, on the plantation, <laughs> during slavery, I'm asking the question, is it or is it not the case that black women on a plantation rely on the master and Miss Ann for her sustenance and play second fiddle to Miss Ann? And anytime the master asked for it or got ready for it, that he can engage in sexual relationships with any woman he wanted to on that plantation. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So where is the lie? I'm saying that our culture has emanated from slave culture. I don't think that there's any disputation that can be said about that. Tell me where the lie is. Now, I'm not the smartest man. I've always said I am not the most intelligent man on the planet. I'm not the most informed, but I'm pretty informed. I'm not the smartest but I'm not, I don't have the dimmest bulb on the Christmas tree. <laughs> okay. I have some intellect and you know, I have a terminal degree. I have a doctoral degree. Okay. Not just 
some fucking social influencer who popped out of fucking nowhere. I have a fucking doctoral degree. And I study philosophy. And I've studied the philosophy of race. Now I know some of the things I say may not sound politically correct. But I'm coming with candor and frankness, which I find is absolutely missing in contemporary popular woke ass culture. That's my opinion, man. It's my opinion. It's my opinion. And then, look, here we go. Even if that were true, it just shows how weak black men are. Really? Does it really show that that's how weak we are? Really? Yeah, really? I mean, go back to your amazing Lucas motherfucker. Or, if you're a black woman, go back to your fucking master. Be the concubine that you are. Yeah, yeah, go go to go where fuck with your concubine. Go be your concubine. Yeah, yep. Ride and slide out. Which, which, which is, which is what comes out of concubine culture, right? Just what that that statement itself, right? Where does this stuff? Where does that idea come from? Is because the black man was powerless over his woman and his children. Now, first and foremost, like the, the first thing you have to understand mm -hmm. about slavery, in and of itself, is that. Black people were so into slavery or people who are descendants of Africa who were captives of war or criminals or whatever the case may be in or debtors in African culture were sold by African people to white people. Correct? Yes. Yes. So it isn't the case that all African men, you know, all men are just somehow innately just weaker than white guys. No. But, I mean, I want you to think about this shit. I want you to think critically about it. You are outnumbered six to one. You have no weapons. They have all the weapons. They have technology and an understanding of who they are in their culture. You have no understanding of who the fuck you are because you were robbed of your name, your religion, your culture. You don't know who your gods are. You don't have any knowledge. You have been deracinated. And the only motherfucking shit that a whole a chicken neck bitch can say is that you're weak, man. Get the fuck out of here. I'm saying... Explain to me. I want you to explain it. I mean, I don't know what you know about fighting. Most women, you know, they don't really know shit about fighting for real. But I know one thing. To fight one man is fucking tiring as shit. But to fight one man to six with no weapons is fucking crazy. <laughs> and then you're a weak ass nigga. You're a weak man. White men are strong. You weak. Come on, man. What you mean, physically weaker? That can't be the case because we already have seen various instances in which black men, if they're in competition with white men on a level playing field in sports or in other arenas, perform just as adroitly as any man can. Mm -hmm. We got evidence of this, especially as it pertains to Physical physicality, which is the ultimate determinant of what people mean by strength, correct? Mm -hmm. Yes. So I'm just saying, cease and desist with the bullshit. Still speak on whether or not I'm lying or telling the truth. So I don't say this with pride. I'm not saying this because I am in glee about the fact that our culture emanates from concubine culture. I think it's a fucking tragedy. But some people use it, and I wanted you to think carefully and critically about this. You have a group of women right now who would call their own fathers, mm -hmm. who would call their own sons, and mm -hmm. would call their own brothers. Mm -hmm. Some bitch-ass niggas. 
Now you got black men supporting that fucking concubine bullshit. One thing I do know about strength, and also one thing I know about resistance, is that it doesn't just apply to men, it, it, it applies to men and women together culturally. That's one thing I do know. And if a person who's supposed to be on your team sells you out or mm -hmm. doesn't lift up your spirit and encourage you to fight and to resist, then what type part of the fucking game is that? What part of the game is that? If your own mama would sell your ass out for some extra blankets or some fucking pig feet, then what the fuck is her strength? Hmm? Because one could argue that there's more to strength than just physical expression. There's also strength of mental and psychological and emotional fortitude. But I'm done responding to that troll shit. I'm done. You can put that motherfucker on ice now. Okay. <laughs> well, well, the thing is, the thing is, the verbiage and the verbiage that they use is indicative of what's been going on for the last what hundred, two hundred years. Okay, right. nothing has changed. They've been, uh, uh, they've been saying that black men is weak, can't protect his woman, that they're, they're violent, they're irrational. Nothing has changed in hundred fifty years, and that's the issue. Mm -hmm. The problem is, we're trying to draw and tease out the origin for some of the issues and the problems that we have. And right. as soon as we draw out and tease out some of the, the sources, whether they be social, political, economic, we still we talk about these issues, the first thing we get is, oh, you, you shouldn't be saying none of this. You should just, you know, be there and do what I ask you to do and be there and be a real man. What does that mean? Yeah, whatever that is. <laughs> what does this mean? Yeah. And, yes, uh, I do, I do want, look, if white man all this artillery, why does the cartel exist in all 50 states? The, the cartel? You got crime everywhere, bro. It's, it's, be, it's because the, the, the cartel is sanctioned by all 50 states and, and the government to make money. That's why. What you think Snowfall was about? What you think yeah. Ricky Ross was, was about? Yeah. Yes. What you think? I thought you knew the cocaine business runs America. Contra business runs America. Mm -hmm. I the thought you know opium business ran America. The cartels have bank accounts. Okay. <laughs> I thought you knew that there was a strange relationship between Central and South America and Northern America. Who you think? Uh, My mom was in the Peace Corps in Afghanistan. Mm, okay. You think them people out there in the Peace Corps and the the, mil the, uh, the uh, American military was destroying the poppy plants? You think they was burning them to the burning them to the ground? No, they was making money off that. Yeah, there's a very good book, uh, old book by the Larouche Group called Dope Incorporated. Okay, going all the way back to the uh, opium wars in China. Okay, white man, white man has been dealing dope for 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 five centuries. Okay, uh -huh. well, you hey, think look, tobacco and sugar were, was dope back then? Okay, that was your dope. Yep. And shout out to Mississippi Delta guy, man. Shout out to him, man. Appreciate yeah, that Delta. donation, sir. Appreciate you. You know, uh, look, we gonna ruffle some feathers tonight. We gonna get some people upset, hot and bothered. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? It, 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 but it's 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 par for the course. It's it's bound to happen. Especially since you've been kind of like duct taped for the past 50 or 60 years and told that anything that you say that doesn't fit the script that's been set out for you is, you know, uh, tantamount to being traitorous. <laughs> Why people engage in traitorous actions against you. I don't understand how that's supposed to work. Tell me how that's supposed to work. Yeah. But you might not like it, but I'll tell you this. Yo, hey, man, pull your skirt down, B. <laughs> <laughs> Pull your skirts down. <laughs> Pull your skirts down. That's all I can tell you. 
Now, at the end of the day, man, I got some articles, man. Really, actually, the articles are from an author whose name we all know. Mm-hmm. His name is Robert Staples. Okay? okay. And Robert Staples wrote, and I can't go over each and air, you know, single area of these articles mm-hmm. in this stream because it would take too much time. Okay. Yeah. Way too much time. But Robert Staples has written about several issues, and one of these issues is the myth of the black matriarch. <laughs> or what, mm. he, what he calls the myth of the black matriarch. I don't think it's a myth. Okay. I think at the point in his career, Robert Staples is working as a sociologist who's trying to connect and stop the rift between black men and black women occurring. Right. I think his sole purpose of this is to protect the honor and character and the integrity of black women. Yes. What do you think, Dr. Johnson? No, exactly. I think that's precisely what he's doing. I think he was trying to uh, confront the Moynihan report. Um, But at the same time, I think he was grappling with new information that was uh, making it harder and harder to uh, to rationalize. But yeah, I think he was definitely trying to do that. Yeah, he was. Yeah, well, that was a big rift because, uh, especially because black women didn't want to be seen as matriarchs. They wanted to, um, they wanted to blame it. Well, there, there was blame on one white people because they did it actually create the matriarch. But the thing is that uh, um, they they wanted to find a third way. In other words, can we can we fix the black family without blaming women or blame the victim, as they said said back then? Mm-hmm. Now, at the end of the day, so like especially in this space, there are a, lo- a large amount of men, mm-hmm. okay, who will call black women, right, and say that they're you know they're gynocrats. Yes, they be accurate, who, and yeah. who will say that there is a black matriarchy that exists in the black community, mm-hmm. and will say so unapologetically without trying to spare the feelings of black women at all. Yeah, look, man. I just got into a long, you know, debate this morning with somebody in my comment section uh, on this, something similar to this in regard to black men critiquing black women. And at the end of the day, the first people to fight you tooth and nail over critiquing black women will be other black men. Yes. Because we have been socialized to protect her at all costs. Mm -hmm. So even in a red pill space, we see this and we see it repeatedly. We've seen women women come in and make the same points we've been making and brothers will flock over there. We have got, I mean, I think, uh, you know, Sperling called it the simp chip, you know, Mm -hmm. whatnot. It's deeply embedded. We're the first ones to fight with each other over it, you know, and, you know, it's, it, it it is what it is. And I doubt it's going anywhere anytime soon. Cause I'll be trying, I'm trying to get black men to work with each other. Mm -hmm. We're the first ones to attack each other to defend black women. Yeah, yeah, and the thing in the seventies, they knew that black women were in a subordinate uh, position. They were trying to get out of it, but black women didn't want to let them out of it. So now we have uh, gone to actually denying that we are in that position. That's where all the alpha male uh, chest pounding comes from, mm. which is actually ineffective. It's it's not going to do anything. It's not moving the needle on our social situation. Mm-hmm. In fact, black nationalists know, and have always known. That if there is going to be the offering up of any resistance against racism, mm-hmm. that is going to have to start within the micro institution known as the family. Mm-hmm. That's where it's going to have to start. It can't start anywhere else. Can it start in the school system? No, because it's not managed, maintained, and controlled by black people. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It can't be managed by what? It could potentially be managed by the church. But what's the church doing lately? They're offering up otherworldly salvation and trying to use the prosperity gospel. Mm -hmm. Which is a neoliberal gospel of, you know, like hedonism and wealth accumulation. Mm -hmm. Which appeals to women. Which is prioritized to women, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Matter of fact, I just saw a poll this morning where churches are trying to get more black men in by shaming black men. Mm-hmm. Not servicing black women. It's it's the same kind of tactic, but this is what they're doing. 
your your manhood is based on how well you provide for and service your your woman and your family. But also but, how how it makes her feel. Mm-hmm. But at, at any rate, some some interesting things that are said in the mm-hmm. context of this article here by uh, Robert Staples. Okay. Okay. So the first thing he says is that uh, you know it, it's cruel, you know, to, to call black women matriarchs, you know, uh, because the, the the situation was brought into being by forces outside of the context of black women's control. And I think we would agree with that. Yes. We understand that, okay? But he does admit, and here's where he admits it. He says, like like most myths, the one of a black matriarchy contains some elements of the truth. Mm. Now, what he characterizes as the truth here really doesn't, you know, get to where I want to get at. But, I mean, look, the first thing he does is he tries to say, well, you know, a matriarchy... Is a society in which some, if not all, of the legal powers relating to the ordering and governing of the family, power over property, over inheritance, over marriage, over the house, are lost in women rather than men. If one accepts this form of definition, then basically there are no matriarchies. And then I would argue that's just as I get what he's trying to do in terms of a move, but that's just not accurate in this instance. Mm-hmm. Because let's face it. Who governs the family in the black community? Um, w- women. Who basically manages the inheritance in the black community? Who has yeah. control over whether you stay married or get divorced? Mm-hmm. Who gets the house and who determines where people are lodged and whether or not they can stay there? I mean, I've been in situations where I, I, a woman would tell you where the fuck you can sleep in the house. <laughs> I want you on the couch. Huh? Fuck you mean you want me on the couch? Or I want you to leave. No, you need to leave. Fuck I need to leave for. And when, when the matriarch dies, does he pass the, the wealth down to her son or to her daughter? Well, you know, I'm not gonna go I'm not gonna go and say <laughs> it always goes to, to, to the daughter. You know, say I mean, I'm pretty sure like if like my inheritance came to me because I'm the only child. You know what right, I'm saying? But right. I mean, but the point is, a lot of times it's it's basically stated that you're a man, you got to get it out of the mud. Yeah, mud. Yeah. Yep. If you're a woman, you need to be kept. Be kept. Yep. Be assisted. You know, uh, when I live that. When, when my child when when my children moved out, basically my son had to get it out on his own. But uh, uh, with my daughters, uh, the first one rent was paid. Uh, uh, the house was furnished, helped furnished by the, by the matriarchs and and the family, and uh, and some of the bills were actually turned on by the family. Right, my son got none of that assistance. Yeah, I had the same experience. Mm-hmm. But, but all I'm saying is this argument in and of itself. I think that the Western culture that we live in mm-hmm. is not a patriarchy, especially as it pertains to the institution of the family right. anymore. Anymore, yeah, I it agree. doesn't exist. Now, you might say that the culture at writ large in other domains and areas mm-hmm. is, but I can guarantee you inside of the context of family life, even for white folks, there is no longer a patriarchy where men have absolute control over the stewardship of their children and get yeah. to manage property and tell women what is going to happen like a dictator. Right. That doesn't. This is not Roman Empire. No. <laughs> this okay? is a... This is Hobbes the Leviathan acted out in real time. Basically, the state, the state is arbiter and a controller of all things social and sometimes in business. Right? They can you have to apply to the uh, to the to the Leviathan to grant you uh, privilege. Okay, just like a king. And the state, especially in as it pertains to family in, familial institutions in the United States, are right. governed over and regulated by judges. By judges, yeah. Increasingly, who are now women. Yes. And in Frank, more black women than black men. Mm-hmm. Increasingly. I know judges. Okay? <laughs> like, I got a text from a judge today. <laughs> Ask somebody about it. 
but the core so, of it though is we it, the black community is always going to have a different uh, context uh, you know it is what it is we're always going to have a different context and that's and that's what i i think even staples doesn't adequately you know use this concept to acknowledge not adequately he he didn't have to take a generic definition of matriarchy and question whether or not the black community falls into it but he needs to specify it to the history go ahead so anyway look before i even move on i just want to say this okay the argument here is dicey because as i've noted elsewhere and i got this in small print the empire the father was set apart the the, the seeds of discord related to the empire of the father falling were set into motion in the middle of the 17th century so you had an act called the Tenures Abolition Act, mm -hmm. right? Which was aimed at ending feudal tenures and military service obligations in England, okay? And the provision allowed fathers to appoint guardians to their children by will. So it basically appears to be like a small little footnote in something larger, but it would eventually change the dynamics of what child custody actually are. So basically... The provision was supposed to extend the power of fathers, but it actually ended up curtailing the power of fathers because the court, by increasingly being involved more and more over the supervision of children by means of, you know, like adjudicating disputes related to testamentary guardianship, they then turned that experience into actually supervising and intervening over fathers' rights pertaining to their children okay so basically over time the courts got involved in custody matters whereas they weren't involved prior to the tenure's abolition act this is the beginning of the end and then eventually you get something called the custody of infants act which took place in 1839 and after that, I think in 1873 uh, or 1879 or something of that nature, somewhere close around that, that right. part, the, the age at which women were able to maintain custody of their children was extended right. by the tender years doctrine. And then right. after that, it morphed into something called the best interest of the child. Mm -hmm. But anybody who's a man that's had to deal with custody issues knows that what is normally assumed to be in the best interest of the child. Right. The mother, uh, their, their relationship with the mother, the relationship that the child has with the mother during their tender years. Right. So patriarchy in family life in America and in the Western world in general, because English law is common law. Anywhere where there is common law, a common law tradition, you're going to see the truncation, the curtailing, the attenuation of father's rights. Now, no, I'm, I'm just saying. This is scholarship, man. A white woman wrote this paper. Yes. Abramowitz. Susan Abramowitz. Go look the shit up. Now, I know some of the things we say may not. I know I'm crass, okay? I'm not very diplomatic. Dr. Johnson, you're more diplomatic than I. And BGS also, it seems like you have more sense than I do. Okay? <laughs> Sometimes. I know I'm hot, man. I, you know, like Hulk. <laughs> I like to smash shit. But I, I also like to proliferate the truth. I like to talk about what actually occurred so we can actually assess what's going on. Yeah, yeah, but Lord is signed as a criminal, though. You can't trust him. <laughs> anyway. Anybody that worth their weight and salt knows that, like Staples is going to admit here, even though he's trying to guard women against being accused of being gynocrats, that the ordeal of slavery changed the life of Afro African Americans. Mm -hmm. And it changed the dynamics of male and female roles mm -hmm. that would have normally obtained in African culture. Mm -hmm. Okay? And he goes on to say something like the financial value set on slave children and the rewards given to successful motherhood were rewarded in cash. Mm -hmm. And they were promoted often from field to house slaves related to how many births they were. They could, you could even get free. You could become free by mm -hmm. having enough children. You could. Yeah. 
This is why we say this is concubine culture. I don't know how it's not. Now, it might sound harsh, but it is what it is. Yeah. Right. The status of the father could only enjoy if placed in a position akin to that of a stud animal. That's the only the only fatherhood that you're going to be acknowledged for is your sperm dissemination. That's it. Mm -hmm. And it led to the breaking of family ties and the degradation of family life still further. Mm -hmm. This is what we say when we say that black culture is an offshoot of concubine culture. It's not to stigmatize women and to talk about how innately or ontologically fucked up they are. We're talking about historical facts that can be proven by looking at the archive. All you got to do is look at it. And we also know that under slavery, the black father, the American black father was forcefully deprived of the responsibilities and privileges of fatherhood. <laughs> Only the mother child bond continually resisted the disruptive effect of economic interest dictated, uh, that dictated the sale of fathers away from their families. Mm -hmm. And also in the plantation, The woman's role was more important than that of her husband. The cabin was hers. Mm -hmm. And the rations of corn and the salt pork were given to her. Mm -hmm. not, her not the man. Right. Mm -hmm. Given to her. She cooked the meals, tended the vegetable patch, raised chickens or whatever. Mm -hmm. If there was a surplus to sell, the money was hers. Mm -hmm. She made the clothes, reared the children. If the family received any special favors, it was through her efforts. In the black slave family, the black woman was independent of the black male for support and assumed the type of leadership in her family life not found in the traditional European patriarchal family. Now he's admitting this shit. Mm-hmm. Okay. White society continued to deny black males the opportunity to obtain the economic wherewithal. So now, here's the thing. We are still having conversations about masculinity mm -hmm. related to economic provision mm -hmm. in a context of a culture that has done everything it's, it, it can to ensure that we don't have the economic floor to actually have any kind of leadership or involvement in our family lives. Mm -hmm. And the only thing we get is some shit from a, uh, some motherfucker named XOXO that we, 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 we weak ass niggas. <laughs> and men saying the same shit. Right. It ain't just women saying it, it's men saying it as well. Shout out to Adrian Thomas. Shout out to him. Says, coming from the shadows to pass the collection plate for this sermon. Shout out to Mississippi Delta guy, Obi-Wan. As a uh, BM simp, there are no gynocrats here. Shout out to him. Shout out to uh, Man Friday. Ain't heard from you a while, man, over there across the pond. Been a minute. Uh, to the urban naturalist apothecary, he says, I greatly appreciate this space. Shout out to you. And uh, I might have missed some people before, but shout out to Mississippi Delta guy again. Indigo flow again. Conversations like these are priceless. We're having them whether you fucking like it or not. Okay. Cameron 87 was cracking with you. He says on study break, uh, shout out to uh, GG, Dr. T and BGS. Med school trying to take me under. No, it ain't going to take you under, man. No, sir. You got this. Mm -hmm. Got that. Uh, Justin Merch. A March, rather. Uh, shout out to you, man, for the $10 hitter. Shout out to Blade Runner 27X. He says, this is classic fire support. Shout out to him. Shout out to uh, Nanga Iboko. Showing some uh, appreciation for the content. We got brethren in Africa listening. Uh, Dub Will, salute GG and Dr. T. Shout out to him, man. You know, Electrician 480, shout out to you again. 
I just want to make sure I cover everybody. Okay, M Love, Jazz Stack, Salty Balls again, and Barry Little. Shout out to y'all. I just want to make sure I got everybody and nobody's left out. And also, I want to shout out Stack of Star and uh, SL uh, for the Cash App and uh, Kareem Austin, Eon. Well, no, no, that was yesterday. Uh, Rashad McKinney, MLR, SL, and Stack of Star. Shout out to y'all. Okay. Now, now, look, I don't think that black women in America have ontological flaws. Like they're innately somehow backward. I just think that this is a cultural predicament created and artificially maintained by white motherfuckers. Now, I will say, just to be honest about this, I do think that there are quite a few women who participate in this shit and love it to death. Right. Even though a lot of this is initiated by policy and, and terrorism in terms mm-hmm. of these cultural practices, you have a lot of people over the years, over the generations that have come to take this as a norm and enjoy undermining black men. You might not like for me to say it, but you know what Carter G. Wilson said about the back door. We know what he said. <laughs> if you control a man's thinking. Uh-huh. Okay. <laughs> I mean, you do not have to worry about his action. Yeah. When you determine what someone shall think, and this is why I said yesterday that thinking can become a matter of habit. How you think can become a matter of habit. People think that thought automatically gets you out of habit. Not, not necessarily. It can when, also you re- concern if, w- when you determine what a man shall think, you do not have to concern yourself about what he will do. If mm-hmm. you make a man feel that he is inferior, you don't have to get him to accept an inferior status. He will seek it for himself. Mm-hmm. If you make a man think that he is justly an outcast, you don't have to make him or order him to go to the back door. He will go without being told. Mm-hmm. And if there isn't a back door, he will demand one. <laughs> Give me a back door. And this is problematic because a person like Staples is going to say this. This is, we keep, we're staying at odds. We can't get out of the cycle. But that's just Staples though, okay? Like, uh, you know, uh, that's Staples. He, he loves us and he wants to see us do better. I want to see us do better too. But my viewpoint on it is, we can't do better if we lying to each other and we playing games. And we past that shit. I'm past it. Okay? I'm past all the, you know, let's 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 be play nice. <laughs> okay? So there's some things that he says here, like, you know, that I find questionable, you know, uh because this article was written in the 1970s, one year before I was born. Okay. Mm-hmm. And he says something about like the marketplace and how black women benefit from it versus black men. Mm-hmm. Uh, I guess yeah. this was a time at which black men were doing a little bit better than black women in terms of their annual income or whatever the case may be. Right. Uh, they are. They still are. Yeah. But he basically says, and this is the implication that he draws from this. He says uh, the black women in the labor market, uh, the percentage of black women in the labor market declines as the percentage of black males employed in manufacturing and mechanical industries in, is increasing. And I just don't see that as being accurate. No, that's not what Monaghan said. It's actually exactly. The opposite. Yeah. I mean, maybe he found a way to, to get over it by talking about men in manufacturing and maybe he found some like small data or something like that related to mm-hmm. men in manufacturing in the mechanical industry. Right. <laughs> but I mean, in general, Moynihan Scissors was a report about how black men were becoming more employed. Mm-hmm. But black women were 
having more children out of wedlock and were refusing to become married. Mm -hmm. And so the, it was a conundrum. Like, why are these women not getting married? Right. <laughs> the men are, they have more employment than they've had in the past 30 years. Mm -hmm. What's the problem? What's the issue here? So this stands in stark contrast to what Moynihan is saying. So it, one person is correct, one person is incorrect. What's your opinion about this? Well, the thing is, after 50 years, you know who's correct and who's incorrect, okay? <laughs> <laughs> it's not, not even a question. Um, at, at the time, it was up, you know, uh, because Moynihan's Martin, Martin work is actually based on Clark's work. Clark was saying this. And even Clark and, and, and Staples had, were at odds at this. You know, there was a faction that agreed with the with this this matriarchal structural structure, and and the re, actually remedies for it was called the so called the uh, conservatives, if you, for lack of a better term. And the liberals were against, it, especially the feminists. Said it's a it's white man's fault. It's, there's a, a a black male patriarchy that's forcing women into these positions, regardless mm -hmm. of what you think. Men are still in charge of the families, which they weren't. Okay. And what you're doing is beating up, uh, punching down on women, for lack of a better term, uh, that are put in a position that they, that, that, that they didn't actually ask for. They didn't ask for this. So it's not their fault. Right. So we should give them a, a pass, even though functionally it was a matriarchy. And look, at this point, everybody wanted to, like, tender, you know, like women's ego or some shit right, like that. Right. Like, I mean, yeah. for what? Right. I understand people want to, you know, be nice or whatever the case may be, right. but like, let's just be frank about this. Like, look, you can't put lipstick on a pig yeah. and think it's like a fucking beauty pageant contestant. It's lipstick on a pig. Yeah. yeah. If if you got pathology in the culture, and it was black people who were initially announcing this pathology. Yeah. Right. It wasn't wasn't white a white man named Moynihan? No, it wasn't. No. Right. Like you said, it was Kenneth Clark. Kenneth Clark, by the way, is the psychologist who came up with the dial test. Yes. Okay. Which, by the way, the dial test was the psychological study that led to the eventual decision known as Brown versus Board Education. Yes. Just in case you didn't know that. Didn't okay? you do some shows on him? Read some of his work on your on your show? Uh, I think I think uh, BGS did. I don't think I, I have. I, I, I did. I did. I uh, did uh, a dive into his uh, book, uh, Dark Ghetto. Uh, okay. And I, I think that as well. I think Gigi did a did a show on the on the doll test. Right. But you know, I show the doll test all the time. Mm -hmm. Right. Because it's still, I guess the the thought was that desegregation mm -hmm. would lead to an enhancement of the ego. Right, you know, or, or it would increase self esteem right. and self, you know, uh, self image. Yeah, yeah, the self image of black children. Mm -hmm. Right, but it's it, it's not working. <laughs> it has not it has not performed its function because you have children today. If you give black children the test today, mm -hmm. you're still going to get similar results that you did back yeah. then. And, and, and they have. And it's reinforced not only here, but also they did this in Latin America, and the same, the same kind of results came back on the test. But the thing to remember about this particular piece too is, you know, as Gigi said, it was written in 1970, right, mm -hmm. or at least published in 1970. So this is years before deindustrialization. This mm -hmm. is years before the prison industrial complex really begins to kick up. So mm -hmm. when we talk about Moynihan being proven right. There's mm -hmm. major things that haven't happened yet that that really do confirm uh, that Clark and Moynihan were correct. Yeah. yeah. But you know what the thing is, I've also played some pieces like from uh, uh, from some people like like uh, from James Earl Jones, uh, from other people that said that women were unwilling to actually give up control of the family. Whereas and, now. And look, I, I'll show you, I will show you the video I always show. Mm -hmm. And it's called the van. It's a clip from the vanishing black family where you got right. young girls. We ain't talking about mm -hmm. slaves, mm -hmm. right? But we see how the viewpoint that men are non-essential to family life, how it persists in black culture. Right. This is not a problem of a motherfucker being an alpha man, man, or being strong and shit like that. It's not what this shit is. Mm -hmm. But I mean, you know, people just refuse 
to believe this any it's anything other than that. It's not about how tall you are. It's not about how much money you make. It's not about how big your dick is. Because I'm pretty sure it's a lot of big dick baby daddies out there. Mm-hmm. <laughs> okay? The point is, this has become a cultural norm. But you exist at the periphery of family life as a man. Mm-hmm. And this- we can say, oh, well, that's just... You you picked a bad woman. This is a fixture right. in African American culture. Mm-hmm. This is what makes that paragraph you have highlighted at the bottom so important. Uh, can you scroll up a little to get so we can see the whole end of the uh, that section? Right this there. One here? Right. So it says any inordinate power that Black women possess, they owe to White America's racist employment barriers. The net effect of this phenomena is, in reality, not black female dominance, but greater economic depression for families deprived of the father's income. He, he's he's tap dancing around the impact of having mm-hmm. this inordinate power over time and what right. that does to a woman's sense of entitlement. He's dancing around all of that and only trying to suggest this is a product of racism, which makes the entire black family vulnerable. In which other words, she's true, she's, but he's missing the other component as far as what happens when you continue to offer one demographic access and resources and defer to them? And, and it, you know, it, it, we're going to pretend like this doesn't have an effect over generations. Right. And he should, even though they're wielding proxy power, it's still power. It's still power, especially if, it, if, if it's consistent. Mm-hmm. I mean, we may be seeing a, a kind of a breakdown of that proxy power now, but shit, how long has this been going for? Uh, <laughs> uh, about 150 years, you know. She assumes her position. Mm-hmm. You know, I I I have a, a video uh, clip I'd like to play, but you know, she'll show you. Yeah, play no, play it. Well, I got to pull it up, but I'll tell you, I'll pull it yeah. up. Okay, in, in, yeah, in when, fact, you, when you get in, there. In fact, uh, the Mon Conference was saying that more black women have have always owned more property than black men. Mm-hmm. Always, but, but but here's the deal, right? So mm-hmm. this is what he says in '70. Okay. You fast forward to 79, he's saying something like, hold on, wait a minute. <laughs> he, he changes his tune. So we haven't even gotten to that point. I don't want to make this show too long. I, I, we, at the most, it'll be two hours and 30 minutes. I don't want to hold you any longer than that, okay? Uh, and, and we'll disband from this, just period. But the only thing I'm trying to draw out is, mm-hmm. is that our culture is predicated upon slavery in which black men have been pushed to the periphery of family life. Mm -hmm. Now, we can talk about weakness and strength and all of this shit, but come the fuck on, man. Like, are we being serious about this? Like, we are only, even at the present moment, what, 6% of the fucking population? Right. What the fuck do you expect us to do? You gotta be a super superhero. You expect for us to fucking, you know, Leap tall buildings in a single bound and fucking fight the man or some shit. Come on, man. If you just look at, let's just take $150,000 a year as income. At what percentage of black men earn that? I think it, well, less than how many? You what? Tell me. Uh, 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 BGS. We talking what? Under 5%? Under 5%. Yeah, 4%. Yeah. Notice how common. The expectation that men be able to earn that has become it's almost at a certain point considered not enough. Mm-hmm. And we're talking about for a woman that makes thirty five thousand dollars a year. Yeah, if she's working at all. It's still considered not enough. It's become common. And I'll agree to the extent that one hundred fifty thousand in twenty twenty three is not what it was in eight nineteen eighty five. But when you look at the percentage of men who earn this. We're still treated like you're you're there's something wrong with you if you don't earn it. Like there's something you've done that that you're subpar for. And we shame each other, even mm-hmm. in red pill spaces, about whether or not you make enough, but refuse to look at the reality. I mean, hell, I'll tell you why. I know exactly I know as a whole doesn't do that, doesn't earn more than that. But the reason people do it in this space is because like like a I did the presentation yesterday. I don't know if people caught on to it. I don't know right. if they, you know, they, they found any import in it at all. But the reason that men in this space think this way is precisely because of the alpha yes. mythology 
that has been espoused in popular culture that came from Rudolph Schenkel, David Mack, which then matriculated in the business world. Okay. And, and I can see why it would exist there because, I mean, think about it. The whole concept of conflict, you know, leading to a competition, leading to an optimal outcome is something that you find in, you know, like Adam Smith's Wealth of Nations. Mm-hmm. The invisible hand, men competing, you know, leads to efficiency in so far as com- competition in and of itself brings out the best in the competitors. And mm-hmm. the only thing that survives is the efficient and the useful product, right? Or, or the service. So, I mean, I can understand how the ideology could take up ste- or pick up steam in that kind of environment, okay? But then it went from the business world into the dating world where well, you can get some pussy if you're an alpha guy. If you're a weak, whiny man, you can't get no pussy. Here's why you, you know, you're, you're not getting any, any action. If you just do what I tell you to do. You'll get the action. Mm-hmm. And to me, what this is, is selling men snake oil. I mean, like these pickup artists, <laughs> like they have perfect fucking, you know, like romantic lives or some shit. Come on, man. Keep it a buck, bro. Stop the fucking cap. I put a short in the private chat. GG. I just, man, stop, stop the fucking, stop the cap, man. That's all I'm saying. Let me, let me stop sharing. Let me move this right quick. And this, uh, just, this, this is just a quick observation about the entitlement that we're talking about in relation to a lot of these institutions. You're going to see what I mean in short, in short order uh, in terms of how women have been socialized. So let me share the screen. You start it over again. Okay, here we go. I can't imagine giving this man any amount of money that I work hard for. Come on, man. Now, hold on. The kids are eight and five. Right. So you got to give it to him. She was stripping. I was, and I'm an exotic dancer. She was stripping, you're on. I'm an exotic dancer. And that's dancer. how I met her. They was playing me in the club. I'm an exotic dancer, but he didn't have that problem when we got together. And the years that we were together, he wasn't complaining then. But it's regarding my- Do me a favor, you're making me dizzy, rocking back and forth. Yeah, just child support is set at $2,300. $2, you're gonna do you, a you're reimbursement to Medicaid for $276, making your monthly um, child support payment, $2,576. <laughs> that's Thank how much you gotta pay. No, that's nah. how much you gotta pay. Thank you, you. The own. children live with him. Thank but you, you. Did you have any questions about that number? Not at this time, Your Honor. I can't imagine. <laughs> <laughs> what did you want to say about that, Doc? Never dawned on her that she might be responsible. This is, the, this is what I'm talking about when I talk about entitlement. She went into that knowing that this was going to work on her behalf. Mm-hmm. And that's only because there's been such a long-standing practice of that being the case. This is something that young women have learned as little girls from mothers and grandmothers and aunties at this point. This is what I mean when I say multi-generationally. Multi-gener- They've learned you are in the position of authority. You can get the police on him to get him to act right. You can assault him and nothing's going to happen to you. You can take him to family court. These are institutions that operate on her behalf so dependably that when it turns the other way, she has no frame of reference for it. All she could do is be shocked and then be silent. Yeah. Yeah. But hey, they, and more, more of them need to be shocked. I mean, my, my viewpoint on it is this. Women in general, and I mean black women as well, they asked for this shit. They did. Women ask for equality in the marketplace. They did. Now, if you want equality in the marketplace, then you have to take up responsibility in the marketplace. I mean, you would think that that would be, you know, like an understanding. Like, oh, okay, well, if I get more power, then I got to take on more responsibility. If I have access to positions, you know, in... Uh, school or in you know like corporations or government jobs that I, I'm going to have to use what I earn in order to provide for other people in my immediate familial life like wh- why would you not, why would you think anything otherwise 
What, you think you're going to be able to make all your bread and just keep it? Like, men don't think that way. Mm-hmm. Man, please highlight Robert Platinum's comment. See this shit? He said, uh, yeah. I had a young female cousin yell at, the, yell at her mom, I can't wait to get pregnant so that I can get my own place. Damn. That, that, has, <laughs> that, has been, that has been the modus operandi for the last 60 years. Get pregnant, get get on the county, and get out of the house. That's what I, for anybody who was listening to my show yesterday, I was talking about safety nets. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about because I don't know, I've never heard of a man at any age who got somebody pregnant and said, "Good, now now I'm gonna be able to get a place." No, no. It used to be a, a woman would get black woman would get married to get out of her mama's house. Okay, but mm -hmm. now the uh, now the state has replaced the man. But. It, at the end of the day, all you got to know about that article, really, for real, is that in the black slave family, the black woman's independence from the black male mm -hmm. led her to assume a leadership role, which you don't really regularly find in societies that aren't impacted by these kind of, you know, structural or societal arrangements, right? Mm -hmm. And it was maintained by the persistent denial of economic opportunities for black males. That's why mm -hmm. black men are fucking in an uproar like, damn. Many of the problems that we see could be satisfied if you enable black men to be empowered in the context of this culture. Guess who else said that, uh, Doc? Moynihan. Moynihan said it. Mm. It's exactly what he said. Precisely what he said. He reiterated the same thing in his speeches. The exact same things. If you give, give black men the, the economic wherewithal to actually lead their own families, we can bring down welfare and bring down, uh, eliminate this matriarchy, okay? Guess who bucked against it? Mm -hmm. Black women. Yeah. I'm, yeah. I'm not gonna say black women were the only people who bucked against it. Mm -hmm. it, it. Black, first of all, like, anytime that there's a chance for black boys to have something, mm -hmm. the usual suspects, they come up, they pop up. White, white, white women, women mm -hmm. gay uh, white motherfuckers, and black women, they follow mm -hmm. behind them. That's that's mm -hmm. the order in which you see the waves of assault. The Holy Trinity, huh? Well, in ma mainstream society, I mean, there's work, there are arguments out there that the reason you have a civil rights movement era was because it really is underpinned by the employment of the World War II era. Mm -hmm. Black folks are, are migrating northward for jobs, mm -hmm. right? So, so the question is, if you are, if you, if you employ black men, you you find a way to extend stable resources over long periods of time where black men can have families mm -hmm. in, in large measure across the economic spectrum. Mm -hmm. What you're really talking about in 20, 30 years is potentially an opposition mm -hmm. to the state and how it runs from those who are, who are educated and structured and, and have families. This mm -hmm. is not something that the state by and large has ever seemed optimistic about or excited about or willing to do. Right. Even though black women opposed it because it meant that they lost, they would lose some degree of authority, even mm -hmm. though there are other groups at play that lose some sense of status or whatever. We know that the state is also concerned about what black men do when they've had a generation of stable, of a stable well-being to raise families. Yes. And that's never been something that America in particular has been excited about. Because the last thing they want to do, especially is see a black middle class, not only a black working class and a black underclass, but a black middle class in alignment mm -hmm. in, in terms of critiquing the state for its treatment of the black community. They don't want that. You don't get that the same way when an overwhelming majority of families are female led. You don't get mm -hmm. the same result. Mm -hmm. So in that article, man, he talks about the sexual exploitation of black women. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he talks about how Black females were forced into sexual relationships with white men to maintain true the purity of white females, which you can't deny, okay? But then you also can't deny that many of these women felt like they were set up. And it, you know, like this was a fucking easy life for a slave to be a, a mistress of a white dude. Mm -hmm. I mean, we, we, we act like that shit did not occur. Yeah, and, want, and wanted to be promoted to wife instead of just mistress. Mm. Now, people, you know, as soon as you say that, then everybody's like, oh, you're fucking, there you go, blaming the victim again. But this is the thing that I don't like. I'm an equal opportunity offender, meaning that I can be offensive to anybody. My whole viewpoint on it is this. 
in relation to being a coon, a black man can be one, but a yes. black woman can be one just as fucking well. Just as fucking Even more so. Yep. But the but if the way you've been socialized, the hair stands up on your neck whenever you hear black women critiqued, we're going to have a hard time getting to the goddamn source of the problem, even in terms of, of dialogue and analysis, because you're going to have people that continue to resist simply because she's uncomfortable. Hell, simply because she might be uncomfortable with what's talking about, what's being talked about. I can't tell you how many brothers have communicated to me that they're listening to my show sitting in the car, but they won't go in front of their wife and listen to it in the house. Yeah. I don't blame them. Though. Like, I, I don't blame them though. You know what I'm saying? Cause they already, we acting, we're acting as if there aren't real world consequences for the shit we're saying. No, I'm saying there are. I know, yeah, yeah, I get it though. Uh, yeah. There are real world consequences, but at some point let's deal with the shit. But if you're going to keep tap dancing around it, you can't be surprised when change is that much slower. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for sure. I, for sure. Yeah, for sure. I, you know, I admit it. I, all, all I know is, you know, look, it's the reason a lot of motherfuckers ain't showing their faces saying this sort of shit that's being yes. said. Yes. <laughs> yeah. it, it, it ain't even, to me, this shit is not even all that controversial, the shit that we're saying. It should but be. People don't want you to utter it. And that's the, that's the crazy thing about it. In a culture that's supposed to be predicated upon, like, you talk about negative liberty, what's the first fucking amendment in the United States pertaining to? That's freedom of speech, I do believe. Freedom of fucking speech. That's the fuck the first freedom. Mm-hmm. But this country has made it such that, you know, like, and the odd thing about it is white women were leading the charge with this, but like you can't even critique a, a woman. That's misogyny. Yeah. You, can't, you can't say anything to Miss Ann or about anything that, uh, related to her value system, her axiological system. You can't say anything. I'm like, how the fuck, how, how the fuck did y'all get exempt from genocide and colonialism, slavery and Jim Crow and lynching? How, how did you, how did you, how were you able to turn yourself into a minority group? How? It's, that's some, that is some genius shit. It's genius. Yeah. It, it, it's, it's my entire lifetime. I've never seen a collective of men get together and push back and respond. I mean, we've talked about racism. And some of us lost our lives doing it. Don't get me wrong. Right. But when you talk about the way race and racism employs this gender war, employs this gender dynamic, this gyno, this uh, gynocracy, we not only can't talk about it, but men that are ourselves, we don't begin to talk about it until you have a free social media framework that offers the opportunity for anonymity. This is the first time we see brothers who are willing to speak. And before we even get, we, we've, we've even completed developing the vocabulary for us to articulate ourselves and speak up. You got brothers attacking each other simply on the basis of how much it might offend women to hear what we're saying. Mm-hmm. We can't get to the next stage where we can actually show our faces and not lose our jobs because of what we're saying. Look, we're over here analyzing a paper written in 1970. Mm-hmm. And we can't do that without serious blowback. Do you it, this, do you see how ridiculous that is? Are you weak? You know, talking about 2023. You're not we an alpha. Review, you're not a real man. We can't review a paper from 1970 without brothers have to worry worry about losing their marriages or their jobs. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's fucking ridiculous. You're not a real man. <laughs> about, about, about obvious things. And the stuff is obvious. I mean, it's so bad that it's, it's redundant, but nobody wants to speak the truth. Or admit it. So at any rate, you know, one of the things he also does in this paper, I think we're mentioning is saying that like mm-hmm. there were black men who resisted against black female sexual exploitation. Mm-hmm. He talked about Denmark Vesey, Nat Turner, Frederick Douglass, David Walker. I've covered like at least I know I read I read the entirety of David Walker's appeal online mm-hmm. and demonstrated the ways in which Christianity Although, you know, a lot, a lot of people say it's nothing but a slave religion. Well, I mean, to who? Could be a slave religion, but it also could be a catalyst for freedom if it falls in the right hands, right? So uh, Frederick Douglass was once a slave. He fucking, you know, he beat one of his fucking uh, slave masters, didn't he? Yes. He, he whipped one of their asses. 
and married a white woman back in the motherfucking uh, days of right after fucking emancipation. He got some balls. <laughs> <laughs> Can't say he didn't. Okay. And he also says that there are oftentimes stories told that valorize women like Harriet Tubman or Sojourner Truth. But he says this is often used as a tactic to perpetuate like the idea that the black women are strong and resilient and all this kind of shit to undermine strong black male figures. Okay. Um, so, you know, he already talks about the uh, Moynihan report, but I think, I think the biggest issue to me I have with Staples in this paper is when he talks about fatherlessness and, uh, I just don't like what he has to say about it. I mean, ultimately he says that uh, there's the idea that black mothers favor their daughters over their sons is a misconception. Okay? Mm. <laughs> he does say that, okay? He, he says it. <laughs> and But he talks about how black mothers are left in this un, you know, bearable situation where they often have to repress their son's aggressiveness out of fear for their son's safety, which in other words, like my viewpoint on it, you know, is this man, a human being is made in the formative years of his early childhood. Mm -hmm. That's where your character and your personality is going to be the most malleable. Mm -hmm. But who's in control of that primarily? The mother. If she doesn't have consciousness, of how to resist against the system mm -hmm. or like she feels comfortable within the dysfunction of the system what's mm -hmm. going to happen to the child especially a male child yeah yeah who she has to teach to basically be a unit to be passive yeah to be passive and and, and the daughter to be what aggressive because we all know that women are allowed a certain amount of latitude mm -hmm. <laughs> To express, you know, frustration, anger, and things of this nature, mm -hmm. more so than men, mm -hmm. especially black men. So, you know, like Mammy could speak in ways that, like, the male slave can't. Right. You, you saw going with the wind. I know that's kind of like clicheish, but I mean, come on, we, we know this to be the case. Yeah. We the, see the, it in we see it in culture writ large. The, right now, you got a case in which you got a black woman who went to the fucking UAE. Mm hmm. And we got, we already got issues. We we already have camera footage of this chick clowning like a motherfucker, throwing yeah. soda at niggas and shit. Yeah, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Running around with a knife and shit. And other women are bringing it up like this bitch is crazy. Yeah, it, 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 even the the, the Julia and Nathan Harris said the same thing that uh, black women, you know, were the liaison between black men and the uh, and, and white culture. In other words, the black man couldn't approach the white man or the white overseer uh, or the white uh, landholder on his own. His wife had to do it because she had more latitude in, in vo voicing her opinion. So in other words, she is almost like to use the, the reference to a god in order to make sense of it. She's yeah. like Greek god Hermes or some shit. Right, right. Or or like Papa Legba. Yes. <laughs> She's the one that's the interpreter for, for the the field Negroes. For the field Negroes, yes. <laughs> it's fucked up, bro. So she's put in an elevated position because she's she's the one that can actually uh almost like being an attorney, you know, to the court. You know, she's the one that can actually speak to the court, whereas you can't on your behalf. So she's in an uh, uh ele elevated position in the family. But this because, is what he this this is what he says that really fucks me off, right? He says that. There's a misconception in linking fatherless homes to juvenile delinquency. Really? A and he says the real issue lies in economic disparities faced by single mothers, right? So they have to compete in a society that rewards male leadership, but like yeah. they're, they're what, we, what we need to do is give single black women more money. That's the shit that, that's what it sounds like to me. Mm -hmm. it's, yeah. it's a denial of what needs to be done that he knows needs to be done. Because I mean, mm. if, if it's the case that you know that black women are in the position that they're in precisely because black men have been left out of having an economic floor, then what the fuck you think the, the solution to the problem should be? What? Just give pump money into women's hands? Yeah. Or to give men the opportunity to actually earn money 
not through you know a welfare agency, but for investment in in infrastructure or something. Right. Right. It ain't even black men don't even need a fucking like we ain't asking for Section Eight. <laughs> we ain't asking for you know like for for, for a homestead act, which you know mm-hmm. white people don't turn down shit when it's offered to them. Mm-hmm. They don't turn down shit when it's offered to us, and they take it. <laughs> <laughs> Damn, well, that was a good one right there. You got the majority of welfare, the majority of affirmative act, affirmative action positions. Mm-hmm. Hell, I put up the chart on those DEI uh, uh, positions and corporations. The majority mm-hmm. of them were white women. White women, yeah. They so, take more shit. They are the true the model minority or white women. This is the thing that fucks me up, right? So what people do is they point to the strength and the resilience of black women and how they made things work, you know, despite all of the shortcomings and, yeah, you know, despite all of the, the hardships and shit like this. But it's like you want them to continue on in the same state. They want them to continue on the same state. And, that's, and, and that is the issue. Yeah. But nobody wants to talk about that, okay? No, no, and, and, and this is the thing that really fucks me up, right? Mm-hmm. He t- he basically says he questions the notion of black women being more powerful figures in the family, and instead he suggests their perceived power often arises out of necessity or from their husband's deference. Uh oh. Uh oh. I mean, that the man defers to the woman because she knows best because she's the liaison. She's the more educated person. She knows how to negotiate the system better than the black man does. The black man, all he knows how to do is go to work. He can't read, can't balance a budget. In fact, he's just a big educated dummy. I just don't like the stereotyping that's being utilized here. Right. He's... he's Telling the truth, but letting them off the hook. It's, you know, in other words, it's not their fault. You know, they're, they're, they don't have agency over their lives. They've been put in a position where they have to act this way. In other words, like Heidegger would say, they've been thrown into it, right? Yeah. Anyway, he, he basically also says this, uh, that there's a low sex ratio of men to women. So there's more women than there are men, right? right. And uh, this leaves black women with few to little alternatives. Oh, my good Lord. And that they have to accept male, I mean, love on male terms. And it connects this low sex ratio to social tensions. And suggests that this might be a contributing factor to the supposed matriarchal structure. Rather than the result of the inherent uh, inherent characteristics of black women or black families, uh, it's not inherent. It, when you say inherent, that means uh, just the natural, naturally occurring from biology. Yeah, he says that that's not the case, though. He's saying oh, that no, it, yeah. it, he's saying that this low sex ratio is creating the social tension, in part. Yeah. Okay, and and look, I just don't agree with the fact that there aren't enough like decent black men to go around. Man, most black men don't even have nobody. Right. <laughs> it's it's good black men to go around, but the women don't really want these guys. Mm. That's my viewpoint on it. I, I I talked about this on the show that, yesterday. I so mean, there are other people in this manosphere who've been saying this. Like there are a plethora of black men that are available for relationships, for marriage, but these women don't want these guys. Mm-hmm. They don't fit the bill. They don't have the cr- credentials. It's like Ebony K. Williams. I'm not fucking with a bus driver. Yeah, well, what were black, what were black women doing uh, when it was like a, a 90% marriage rate? What were they doing then? They were fucking with them, them same broke Negroes. Same broke Negroes, okay. What happened? In other words, uh, money, more uh, better opportunity came. So what, uh, financial hypergamy? Right. But here's, here's something interesting, though, that he does say. Mm-hmm. He says that the matriarchy theory is set up in such a way that it's meant by white culture. It is purposeful in white culture to create a rift 
of divide and conquer. Okay, just like it was done in Algeria, which is, you know, like a, a post-slavery society, right? Right. Uh, where the division between men and women was used as a strategy by the ruling class to distract from real issues of external oppression. Uh, you know, if you read Diane Stewart's book, uh, Black Woman, Black, uh, Black Love, uh, after emancipation, black men and women were actually forced into marriages. OK, they f they forced uh, black women and black men into a, a, a nuclear family uh, uh, pattern. OK, uh, they didn't do that voluntarily. They were forced into it. OK, you couldn't get a loan. You couldn't get land. You couldn't get anything without being married. OK, they were forced into it. So how could they actually be fighting against it? Doesn't make sense. Yeah. And, and but another thing that's being said though is that uh the last thing he says in this article at least is that mm. there is a growing movement. This is the 70s, right? The, right. the emerging female liberation movement mm -hmm. that's dominated by white women. And he raises the question of whether black women should actually participate in that movement because to him the primary adversary isn't one sex or the other. But white women have been masters at creating this phenomenon. Mm -hmm. They're the ones that said that they were oppressed. Now, how they were oppressed, I don't fucking know. But everybody believes that they were now. Okay? So, uh, well, he basically says our focus should be on the racist and the capitalist system, which perpetuate, uh, perpetuates oppression. But instead, we're creating, like, gender, like, right. fighting. We're, we're engaged in gender wars and shit like this. But he's looking at this at the inception of the modern gender war era because you know talking with bgs we can take this back to slavery right. but if you look at the contemporary moment uh he's acknowledging this as as this new gender war is starting up as predicated on white feminists mm -hmm. right and so what i was missing about this earlier though gg was this is a reprint right because this is reprinted in 1981 even though he wrote it in 1970 if we right, look okay. at the, i forgot it was a reprint that's why i was a little confused because i was seeing 1981 but if we look at the piece he did um, a, a little, I think it was a uh, 79. Uh -huh. You're talking about the, uh, the angry black feminist one? The myth of black macho, a response to angry black feminists. Mm -hmm. but what I think we see, and I'm not trying to say he's, you know, he's we agree with everything. He's on board with everything we're saying. What I am saying is that nine years mm -hmm. had an impact on him. The shift in what's going on in society the impact of what's, what's, what's happening with the rise of feminism, all of these mm -hmm. things, I think, begin to gradually shift his perspective. So that nine-year difference is key, in my humble opinion. But, you know, I'm just saying. I think so, too. Uh, it, it changed his opinion about a whole bunch of stuff, man. Uh, I mean... Let's let's retrace some of the steps that of uh, some of some of the steps of the arguments that he makes within the context of this new article, right? And then, then right. I'm gonna let y'all go because I mean, you know. And I thank you for coming to talk to me and and the people out here, man. This long, uh, related to this, but uh, the angry black feminist, man. It's like uh, <laughs> it's. Let me see if I can find this shit the way I want to find it. Hold on, angry. I'm looking for something specific here, so bear with me for a quick second. Yeah, I think I think what happened was uh, is that the results came in because uh, mm -hmm. empirical facts uh, beat opinions, right? So uh, by the time uh, Michelle was seventy nine uh, came about and it, it, they went against the the uh, the Bakke decision and also uh, the the in increase of uh, out of wedlock births. Mm -hmm. and welfare proved yes. that black women didn't want to be didn't want to be married okay it proved it the loss okay. of employment yeah oh, go ahead and a loss of what well, even before the loss of employment the fact that the, the facts came in the receipts came in what is he going to say yeah. and he's ultimately you know he's more he's an empiricist more mm -hmm. so than, than quite a few so he's looking at the numbers mm -hmm. at a certain point you know i think that does change his position and this is actually what we see happening in in, in online, right? In in manosphere spaces, what in or in the in the black, black manosphere in particular, we see men go from this spectrum, this nine year spectrum that we see staples kind of go through. We see them right. go through that usually within the course of several months to a year, right? You know, especially considering that something 
something usually has jarred them to push them into the space in the first place. Mm -hmm. We watch that transition from blue to red in terms of, of once they start to find out what kind of things have taken place and that they're not crazy. That's the ultimate. And they figure out that this is not something that's just happening to them. Yeah. It's not something that they're crazy about. It's not something they misunderstood because, you know, like many of the women we've dealt with have been gaslighting us for most of our lives about yeah. the observations we have. When you come into a collective of brothers that affirm your experience and then affirm it with data yeah. on top of that. You see the transition that I think Staples kind of goes through within that nine-year period. Go ahead. Yeah. Even white men are, are starting to call Western culture a gynocracy. So, yeah. so yeah, look, in, in, in that article, this Black Macho article, uh, mm -hmm. he basically points out some things that should be clear to anybody who exists in the manosphere who watches my channel that the modern women's movement was really actually dominated by middle-class white women. Mm -hmm. Right. And they were really actually worried about class-related issues, uh, symbolic, really, actually symbolic uh, issues like sexual objectification. Like, come on, man. Like, oh, you're looking at me like I'm a piece of me. Oh, you make me feel uncomfortable. Like, motherfucker, y'all was sexually assaulting people on plantations and shit. Well, he makes <laughs> this point on the first page. He says, relatively speaking, there weren't a lot of black women involved in that, in this movement. But what I've been saying for the longest is, you know, from the late 70s through the mid 80s, you started to see resources being associated with this white feminist movement as it starts to gain traction. And mm -hmm. that's what becomes the lure. Uh, I used to talk about uh, Oprah Winfrey and how she became the kind of spigot to kind of mm -hmm. put a lot of this out there, especially in black America. Right. The reality is prior to that, these black feminist chicks were weird. They were, you know, they were obscure. Mm -hmm. Pretty much had to go to college to really mess with them. They were a very small group. But once it became clear that black women could ride the skirts of white women and they could they could really get access to, to different types of employment. You're talking about going from serving in, as domestics in white folks' houses to white collar jobs. This begins to really speed up all of this. And now and it's been and it's just continued. It's con it's snowballed from 1980 to now mm -hmm. where it's it's unrecognizably unwieldy. It's just completely difficult to work with. But it's been really pushed by policy and resources. Right. This is one of the reasons that it's it's you know I, I was telling BGS this the other day. I don't have a lot of faith that that you're going to see a serious shift by black women. They've been conditioned by multiple generations of resources. Mm -hmm. This has been rewarded with stability, mm -hmm. with yeah. middle class access, mm -hmm. with white collar employment, with status. Even when these chicks make 50000 a year, they're taking trips, they're drinking wine, they're talking about, you're not good enough for me. This is a product of years. This is Pavlovian in some respects. You're talking about decades, probably centuries. Yes. Mm -hmm. but, um, but, you know, you know me, I, I really kick off after the 1960s because I think we just it hits a whole nother speed. But still, mm -hmm. you're right. It's old. And, and, and with that, this is what you get. Yeah, yeah. 1961 is the demarcation of this with with uh, with money and scissors when they actually gave black women the same rights, privileges, and welfare that they gave white women. That's what kicked all this stuff off. How do you repair that? See, people uh, like to make this a matter of black men being this kind of problem or that kind of problem. What I argue is, how exactly do you bring the black family back together again if they if you, you're talking about a one sided conditioning. Now, I'm not saying black men haven't been conditioned, but we haven't been conditioned for access. We haven't been conditioned to rely on a system that provides us safety nets. We've been conditioned to expect nothing. Yeah, right. Uh, it depends on, do you believe in all the king's horses and all the king's men, right? Huh? You believe in that? If you believe in that, you can you can fix it. If you don't, guess what? Humpty Dumpty, Dumpty, Dumpty is going to actually stay broken. Can you put it back together? Well, I, was, I think it was, more, it was always fragile in the beginning. Go ahead. Well, the only thing I think that uh, I think he takes umbrage with with the black feminists is that first and foremost, even like he wanted to keep like the the dynamic of black men and women such that we were working in unity and conjunction with each other and over to overcome racism mm -hmm. and class oppression. That's mm -hmm. I think that's what his goal was, okay. and I think that after the civil rights movement, that's what you expected everything to be about. Yeah. Yeah, okay, but 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 ultimately you got a bunch of middle class white women mm -hmm. who really hijacked the civil rights movement mm -hmm. and 
uh, when it came to critiquing black men, like most white women stayed out of that. Okay. Yeah. But this is something that was written when? When 19, was it published? I think this one is 1981. Uh, okay. Did I get it right? Let me see. 79. Oh, he wrote in 79. Okay. And it's, uh, yeah, it's published in 79 in, uh, in the Black Scholar. So even even information about uh, COINTELPRO is still, re- still you know, relatively fresh. So to right. So, so, I mean, but this, I'm eight years old at this point, and uh, like, at the end of the day, he's like, okay, look, black men weren't really included in the critique of sexism. Because it was primarily aimed at white men. Like, right. and, and to me, this is just a masterful strategy on behalf of white women as an excuse to hijack the gains of the civil rights movement because it's an excuse for them to be able to say, look at how I'm kept out perpetually without ever having to actually remedy what went on in slavery. And then it becomes even more masterful when women pick it up, black women, mm-hmm. because they get to echo the same shit. And if you don't address black males Social and economic ostracization, you never get past the racial or the class-based issue. We stay stuck in it. Because the goal is not to make as much money as a black woman or a white woman, but as the average white man if, if you're a black man. Yeah, or the ideal black, or the ideal white man. Not, not the average white man, the ideal white man. But I mean, look, the wealth gap is driven entirely, mostly, by the differences in income between white men and black men. Mm-hmm. Not black women and white women. At least that's what the recent research tells us, okay? Right. Uh, from from uh, Chetty, who, Reeves, and somebody else. I forget who it was. but um, So, so at any rate, uh, he, in this article, he says that all began to change because it was just about white dudes, then it became about black dudes, okay? Mm-hmm. So... First, there was this conversation about sexual violence, right? Mm-hmm. And then they started to, you know, make the case that like black men are increasingly threat uh, uh, poses a threat to white women. Mm-hmm. I mean, but you saw this back like after Reconstruction and the emergence of the Ku Klux Klan and Jim Crow mm-hmm. uh, and lynching in order to, you know, ward off black men from even thinking that they could, you know, approach white women and shit like this, right? Um, So, you know, of course, like I said, like this harkens back to Jim Crow where like the violation of a white woman by a black man was considered the most heinous of crimes that could exist. And mm-hmm. there were public displays and, you know, of, of ways to ward it off. OK, but then he says like people like Susan Brown Miller, which if you know anything about Curry, if you read the man, not you should know. Mm-hmm. And Diana Russell, they began to propagate this narrative. OK, and. uh even though white feminists were cautious in critiquing black men because they didn't want to be perceived as racist, uh, but white women, after they finally solidified their minority status, um, they began to enlist the, you know, the, a cadre of black authors and shit who were willing to do what white women wouldn't do. Mm-hmm. Okay. Because they knew that they, they knew that they couldn't come out and just critique black men because there was going to be a problem with it. But so they just found black women to do the shit. Okay? So he talks about, like, there's some black women who wouldn't do it. Like, Angela Davis wouldn't do it. Right. Joyce Ladner wouldn't do it. But he says, Nozake, Shange, and Michelle Wallace, they were like, fuck it, we'll do it. <laughs> <laughs> so for colored girls... Hmm? Yeah, they dived in with both feet. Yeah. Well, they, they 12 toes in, not 10 toes, 12 toes. Okay. So for colored girls who have considered suicide, mm-hmm. successful Broadway play across the country, mm-hmm. drawing black women and white audiences to see it, because everybody loves to see the black woman victim by the brute black men, because it's <laughs> the same yeah. drama played out, but now it's a black face instead of a white woman. Mm-hmm. It's the same drama, but it, it's mo- it's modified to fit, you know, the spectacle. Now black women get to participate in the spectacle, okay? Under the idea of their own victimization. So then you get Michelle Wallace 
and the book she wrote, The Black Macho and the Myth of the Superwoman. Mm-hmm. And, and like it's like was publicized to the same, you know, uh, level as Roots was by Alex Haley and shit. <laughs> you know, and Alex Haley, you know, the Roots was a pretty big book. You know what I'm saying? So then what he does is he starts to critique these women. Okay. And he's like, look, y'all middle class, man. Mm-hmm. What the fuck have y'all been through? Y'all don't even know. You ain't even been with no struggle with no dude. <laughs> you, you ain't even 40, 50 years old. You have limited personal experience in dealing with men. Okay? And you're in a different class than most black people. Mm-hmm. And you don't even know like lower class black women and the challenges they face. So he's like, your work already is along the lines of class bias is there. Okay. He then says that there are statistical disparities between college educated black men and women, which I mean, earlier in the other work, he was kind of saying that, you know, well, uh, you can't blame women for this. You can't even really bring this up. You know, it's a feature and a function of racism. But now he's like kind of saying your status within these institutions is going to your fucking head. He didn't say that earlier, though. You know, so like in, in 70, he wasn't saying this. He wasn't talking like this. Okay. So he was like, look, some of these, some of your life experiences are fueling you to write these kind of criticisms of black men. You don't even have any engagement or contact with the men you're, you're critiquing. Right. Which is to him, like it's problematic. Okay. Um, he says, yeah, some black men abuse black women. Uh, but the portrayal of your experiences with black men, I, I don't think it's really accurate. Okay. Um, all this self-love, self-centering. Because uh, if, if you look at the Combahee River Collective, they borrow from Michelle Wallace this idea that we need to look after ourselves. Fuck everybody else. This is where the rift between black men and black women is solidified, mm-hmm. if you ask me. Yeah. In mid-70s, 74, 75, right. this, the group of fugly-ass black women, they even refer to themselves as fugly, fucking mm-hmm. ugly. Mm-hmm. Lesbian black bitches, all of a sudden, their value system becomes the paramount value system of all black women in America. Right. By default. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because it hasn't been challenged. Yeah. I I mean, it's being challenged today, of course. But this this is the first popular challenging of that zeitgeist. Yeah. Since it it began to take uh, 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 gather legs in the 70s. Yeah. As soon as you got your deal, because you got to remember... uh, you had uh, uh, what is it called? Social rights in sixty four, sixty five, right? You, you didn't get economic rights until nineteen sixty nine with the with the Kerner Commission and and the distrib- distribution of, of of resources, right? Then after that, they wanted their freedom. We don't need men, and black men anymore. We need to go actually go for ourselves. That's when it happened. Before that, that didn't happen. And that's crazy, you know. So I, yeah. I will, I'll agree with you. The seventies. The early or the mid seventies is the turning point, right? Of the whole concept of a linked fate. Yes, right. And and it's not black men who issued this rift. No, no. In fact, many black men today refuse to believe that there is even a rift at all, and it the extent yeah. to which one exists is primarily black men's fault. Yes. This is why you need to be the alpha that you got to be. You if she if you were the alpha that you wanted to be, I mean that you need to be. She would fall in line. Which doesn't work. This is why I've been saying for the longest, though. This is why black men still think in in community. Yeah. Still think in terms of community. Black women think in terms of themselves. Mm-hmm. And we're in the transition of starting to make that leap to start to prioritize what exactly our interests are. And we give each other a lot of uh, pushback against it because we don't know how to serve our own interests. We've only been raised to prioritize hers. Got to remember, what is the definition of, of, of community to a black woman? A black woman and her children, okay? Black mm-hmm. men are not included. Black men see the community as all three. 
is a different mm -hmm. definition in community. They believe in the community, just not with you. Mm -hmm. And see, this is where, like, I think when a lot of these women got into the academy, they wanted mm -hmm. to rewrite history mm -hmm. and cast it in their own image. You ever seen the Guardians of the Galaxy? Uh, I think it's the second one. Yes. Where you got the, the white dude, the god guy who wants to fucking make the whole world into his own image and shit. Mm -hmm. Right. It's the same kind of attitude, if you ask me. We got to make everything look like we did it or we were part or like we were so integral. Right. Oh, and even reframe the civil rights movement itself and framed it as, as a bunch of men who were just in, enjoying their patriarchal power over black women and their sec, their insatiable sexual lust for white women. <laughs> if you let if you let black lesbian activists define what the history of black activism in America has been, it's mostly been black men either uh, beating and abusing black women or sexually lusting after white women. That's how they characterize the history of black activism. And that's peculiarly Watson and, and this Sean Gay woman do this. Okay? The Wallace, These, yeah. Like Michelle Wallace is, I would argue, the George Washington of like the Black Comedy River Collective. I swear to God, I, man. Yeah. I, I, I swear to God. I, I, I'm not going to even lie to you. Because mm -hmm. they, they draw inspiration from her work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, you know, so it, here's a middle class black woman who really don't even know niggas. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, that's how I feel about Lucas too. Like, dude, you you're a fucking middle class white dude. I mean, black dude who mm -hmm. really, for me, for all intents and purposes, you a white dude. Yeah, he is. That's how I perceive him. I'm not trying to be ignorant by saying that. Mm -hmm. Like, you feel more comfortable culturally. Around yeah, a bunch of white motherfuckers than you do about, about, around a bunch of niggas. Yeah. Yeah, I'm an LA dude. He sounds like a, one of those kind of guys. A valley boy. A valley boy, yeah. <laughs> hey, bro. I, I know some niggas in LA. Okay. Mm -hmm. Inglewood. Mm -hmm. Whoopty woo. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 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 and, uh, you know, I, I fuck with him. I still fuck with him to this day, man. You know, uh, on a sidebar, man, I love Fat Burger and Quick and Split, man. I don't know if Quick they didn't close Quick and Split. Man, man, that it's was just still, shit, it's boy. still got two. It's still two open, yeah. Man, that shit, boy, them, them pastrami tacos, man. Yes, yep, yep, yep. With the yep. motherfucking fries, boy. And and you get the ice oh. cream, quick and split ice cream on top of that, yeah. Oh man, you buddy, yeah. man, I'm gonna smack my mama. <laughs> <laughs> boy, that shit greasy as a motherfucker, but it's yeah, it is. damn good. It is good, yes. But anyway, uh, before I have a food uh, <laughs> orgasm or some shit thinking about it but um, so what he does is he, he basically scrutinizes Michelle Wallace and the critiques that she issues which are indicative of I think like of where a lot of women are now okay mm -hmm. so he basically says look you don't even discuss the male perspective and give it any kind of legitimacy whatsoever and I think the extent to which, like, men are willing to do this. They're willing to interpolate their perspectives, especially academicians and shit like this. They register women's opinion in their work. Mm -hmm. The question is, are there charitable, charitable representations of black men's work or their opinions or their value systems in the work of black feminists? And Staples is saying, no, they're not charitable to us at all. And they don't legitimize any of our concerns at all. He says, uh, when you start talking about gender issues in the black community, whatever men feel, uh, if they feel worthless, if they feel vulnerable, if they feel left out, they just don't get discussed. They, you're told to be quiet. Mm. And when you are involved, they devolve into accusations of you, you don't give a fuck about black women. Uh, and then it, you know, elides. Mm. Or, or, uh, how, you know, how old is this document again? 79. 79. <laughs> does, that, does that sound familiar? It's it, familiar, man. It predates, right, the current moment. But this is what I would say is 1979 version of Red Pill Rage. Because you also got to understand there's a decorum mm -hmm. that we're supposed to maintain as scholars. So when you publish something, you're supposed to be real kind of milk toast sounding. Mm -hmm. None of this sounds milk toast in terms mm -hmm. of his frustrations with feminists. So this is, to me, this is academic red pill rage in 1979. Okay, speak on it. I think so. 
So I'm speaking on it because I've summarized it. So okay, <laughs> I have. I, you know, it is what it is. So anyway, uh, Staples basically says, "Look, Michelle Wallace's critique of black men, especially the resentment that she has to black men who date white women, mm-hmm. it's a little, it's a little unfair." Um, and also the idea that the economic economic plight of black women needs to be connected to feminism. He thinks that's just misguided. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. And and he says, you know, like who a man, like a black man fucks is really his business. Mm -hmm. It it, it shouldn't be a black woman's business. Now I'm pretty sure he would prefer, you know, that like, I guess like Umar Johnson that black men and women find a way to love each other. Mm -hmm. He feels like this is not my concern, right? Mm-hmm. But and it shouldn't be connected to feminism. These mm-hmm. issues, they, they don't have anything to do with feminism. Anyway, uh, Stable says, okay, Waters makes a few good points about black men not allowing women to have significant roles in civil rights organizations or not being perceived as being like deeply involved. But he says, look, you got to understand the historical context of that time. And it was a general consensus in the black community that black men run these fucking organizations or at least appear in the leadership positions because what was necessary was for black people to be perceived as having, you know, like a viable cultural, you know, legacy to draw from with black men at the center. Because, of course, we already know how black men were like treated during Jim Crow. You're a boy. Mm -hmm. You are... You know, like to a 14 year old white boy, you are a boy if you're a 50 year old man. So, you know, the idea that I am a man, like black women were supporting and pushing that whole notion. And then you have to ask the question today what are black women saying? Yeah. Yeah. You a weak it, nigga. Like, like the chick that was just on here yeah. earlier. Yeah. I, that's because black men was weak. <laughs> Not even like, are you like bitch are you serious like let, let me just say this shit right and this is it, it pisses me off I'm gonna tell you why cause none of you I know this is gonna sound really callous okay but I have to say it none of you negro bitches would fucking be free if black men didn't fight in the fucking civil war true true Have y'all, were, were, were you motherfuckers active with muskets and, sh- and shit in the trenches during the Civil War? Yeah. Because if Negroes weren't involved in the Civil War, black people wouldn't fucking be free today. So the idea that we did not fight for freedom, all we did was just lay and fucking eat watermelon and chicken, you are racist to your own fucking group of people. If you look at the documentation on uprisings on plantations, Mm -hmm. mostly men, Mm -hmm. but even when you talk about the civil rights movement, a lot of the the logic around the presentation of leadership and how things ran, especially around uh, marches outside, police officers and Klan, it was all framed around protecting women. Protecting women. That's why I didn't want, didn't want the women to actually lead these organizations. They were inherently dangerous. And most of these men that led these organizations actually were jailed or died. And many of the women at that time understood that. Yes. It was reframed by the time you get to the Michelle Wallace era and beyond mm-hmm. as, as, as male hegemony and, and you know, oppression. Mm-hmm. But it was centered around ideas around protection. So sacrifice, going back to the Civil War, all the way up through, uh, hell, you could even talk about the, the protests in uh, uh, Ferguson in 2014 and 50. Yeah, yeah. Ferguson, Ferguson, a lot of it was around uh, female protection. Yes. I but played this shit yesterday. I'm going to play it today. Just let me just, but it's being framed, especially by these, you know, black LGBT feminist uh, activists as, yeah. as oppressive even now, even in, even in Ferguson. But they took the protection and reframed it as oppression. Mm hmm. And that's that's deeply problematic, bro. I, I, all I can say is that's 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 the the treachery of that shit. <laughs> yeah, until, until until you withhold it, and then all of a sudden you're blamed for not protecting. Yes, the treachery. 
the, the the absolute betrayal. That's why a lot of black <laughs> men are like, "What the fuck, man?" Yeah, yeah. Like, are you serious, man? Well, so this is why this is why, this is why I want to show this. This is why I want to show this because mm -hmm. I this is something I showed on my uh, channel, but I, I gotta I gotta duck this down right quick. Let me stop sharing this. Remove. Stop the screen. Present. That's all, all the goddamn steps you gotta take in fucking StreamYard is maddening to me. Just, <laughs> just on my fucking nerve. It's constantly clicking and shit. So this is a. Uh... You see, the word sexism was created to replace the word racism. Women's studies was created to replace black studies. Uh oh. You well. see? And now they've raised up black feminists to replace the real sister. Well. Uh oh. And that's what Staples is talking about. But I yep. mean, he's doing so much more diplomatically than, of course, fucking Brenda Verner is because that's a woman talking to other women or about other women. Okay. And she wasn't an academic, right? Uh, I think she went to graduate school, but I don't think she got a PhD. Right. I think she went to graduate school though, because she talks about her experience in graduate school uh, in, during one of her lectures. No, but I'm just saying it's a different it's a different presentation than a than a, you know a cat like Staples who's teaching. He's he's you know he's yeah for sure. It's a different presentation, but I see what you're saying. Right. So so, so anyway, uh, he's like, look. Women were in agreement with black men taking charge and taking up, you know, the, the, the visibility in that movement because it was important for them to show black men strong. OK. So he says, look. The roles that like. And behaviors considered traditional. And normatively like acceptable a decade ago, which is like the 60s or whatever, now they're redefining the sexes. And this change, he says, it presents a challenge if, if, if feminists are going to be honest about it because historically women were a protected group that received reverence from men and children, though they were also limited in their expressions and shit. But like men did what they could to protect them. Even black men, like black men protected black women. And even sometimes black women just was like, okay, fuck it. I'm going to go against the grain and go with Whitey. Mm -hmm. Remember, I always talk about David Walker's appeal mm -hmm. and the story about murder and Afray that was told, I think it was in South Carolina somewhere, uh, where there was a group of slaves being transported and the men who were in chains were able to get themselves free. Now, the women and the children weren't in chains at all. They were allowed to roam free, Okay unfettered but the men were able to break free from their chains and to kill two of the three men who had them you know uh confined or, or you know or had them fettered okay so they begin to make their escape and one of the women basically br helps one you know bring one of the guys you know back to some working order of functionality to where he can get back tell all of the rest of the white slave owners what the fuck just happened and then they all get locked up and killed i mean uh, 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 punished and, and david walker's like what is wrong with this negro bitch i mean it's look at it now look at it now if you look at the rates of police homicide roughly speaking two to three hundred black men die per year it's about what 13 to 20 at most black women so what i'm saying is even white police officers aren't going out their way to beat down and kill black women that's not happening and, and this was some of the tension around the blm era where when black women were complaining about being the most oppressed but everything they were talking about started off a of black male's death so that right. dynamic you're talking about is still in place now but now it's become a question of who can who can claim to be the most abused to get resources. And if they can appropriate blackmail death to do it, we found that they were willing to do it, which is something we couldn't fathom in the 1960s. Yeah, so so it, it also like Staples says something to feminists that's puzzling, but not really if you think about it. He says, look, what a lot of these women are classifying as sexist behavior is men actually acting out how they've been socially conditioned by their mothers and shit. 
Because, like he says, when you look at it, men too are often being subjected to social expectations that they didn't sign up for. Like, they don't want to necessarily support a family. And you see men now like, fuck a family. I don't, I'm not fucking with that shit. <laughs> Save yourself. You got a lot of guys like, I, I don't want to go to war and fight for somebody else's army and shit like that. I don't want to do that. Right? So, basically, uh, he says that black men and women haven't really actually had the privileges of power, right, that were held by their white counterparts. And the continuation of traditional behavior, despite, like, you know, the push against it from feminists, just basically demonstrates that it's hard to change socialization in people. Yes. yes. Especially when you got women who are encouraging and who prefer traditional behavior, male behavior. There's yeah. a whole host of women out here who are like p- pushing, support me. I ain't wanted soft life, but then you, it's mixed messages. So he says, this is gonna be a long drawn out battle. You know, like this, this is not something that's gonna happen overnight. And he says, this is really even more complex when it comes to black men, because black men don't have institutional power to impose subordination on black women. And I think, you know, That's Dr. True. Johnson talks about that mm-hmm. quite, quite often. You know, uh, most settings where you got black people, they're, they're white controlled. Mm-hmm. And the only exception is the black church. <laughs> <laughs> Where's black woman controlled? Right. He says that the family is identified as a black controlled institution, mm-hmm. but black men don't necessarily have, you know, uh, that much control over it because they're not fucking present in it. Mm-hmm. Given the fact that like most, you know, I mean, Kiki. <laughs> Given who? <laughs> who? Who else? I mean, shit, it's a whole bunch of them out there, ain't it? Oh yeah, baby yeah. bumps and shit. Oh yeah, with no man in no man in the mix. No man in the mix. Yep. Ebony K. Williams. Mm-hmm. This is unnecessary and unimportant and insignificant. It's the same shit that these chicks was saying back back like when these chicks was talking. Same shit. Yeah. Raise your hand if you're married. None of you are married. Raise your hand if you would like to be married to your baby's father. <laughs> One. <laughs> the rest of you who don't plan to get married, why don't you plan to get married? I'd like to know that. You, you already have your child to think about and then of a whole family to care to care for you know it's, it's a lot of responsibility and then you don't want the commitments i wouldn't want no man holding me down because i, I think i can make it as a single parent but don't you think you might need help in raising that baby from a man not really i didn't have a father my father wasn't in the home so you know it, it really male figures not substantially important in the family. So yeah, there's that. And I, look, I, I had to show that because mm-hmm. black men are not present in the family. Mm-hmm. Now, some black families are patriarchal if you can, you got some, right? Right. Uh, but single black women often complain about the passivity of black men. Nigga, you, you ain't, you ain't making decisions. You ain't be a man. Yeah. That's just like the chick K. You're a weak man. You, you hear that shit? You niggas ain't. You niggas don't make decisions. You niggas don't. As soon as you start making decisions, the first thing they say is you fucking control them. Yeah. Hmm. Man, I had a chick, bro. I swear to God, man, this chick asked me what I wanted for dinner, bro. <laughs> she did. She asked me what the fuck I wanted. And when I, when I told her what I wanted, when I got there, the shit was some different shit than what the fuck I asked for. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Damn. In other words, fuck you, nigga. I'm going to do what I want to. Yeah. 
But you and know, I had I left the money. I left some money with her. I was like, look, where the money at? <laughs> oh, <I don't> <laughs> Let me that. see that. Yeah. What, what, what is Zora Neil Hurston saying? Out there, eyes are watching God in 1930, right? Man, this chick started trying to press me about this motherfucking money. I say, man, look here. Daddy's like motherfucking Aaron Hall. Daddy's home. I need to see this motherfucking cash. You feel me? Mm -hmm. Don't make me get like motherfucking Wayne Brady on goddamn me, Dave Chappelle. I need to see this bread. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? This is my motherfucking cash. Then, you know, she finally ended up giving it to me. I'm like, man, don't let no. This is the sort of shit that to me is representative of obstinance and like the, the gynocratic, like, I can't let it go type shit. Yeah, yeah. And niggas are left wondering, like, why do I have to go through all this shit? You fuck. If I'd have known you was going to give me what the fuck you made me have, as opposed to what I fucking desired, I would have went and got it myself. <laughs> but this is the kind of shit that team players are supposed to be fucking dealing with. To a team player? How is that a fucking team player? Yo, a person on your team asks you what you want, and they do the exact opposite of what the fuck you want on purpose. Mm -hmm. Hold up, though. This is all I wanted to say real quick about the video you posted. Mm -hmm. That's not even the first generation of black women to be in that position. No. Their mothers, and in some cases, grandmothers, mm -hmm. have experienced what they are being groomed into by the time that video was recorded. Mm -hmm. We're talking about two, maybe three generations of women up to that point, depending on when they migrated from the South, were conditioned into that. Mm -hmm. What year was that recording? That shit had to 86. be like in the, uh, 86. Yeah, 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 86. 86. Yeah. yeah. So what do we, we so we we talking about what? Oh, shit, damn near what? 40? Almost 40 years, yeah. Yeah, man, 38. Damn, man, that's crazy, bro. Mm -hmm. When you put hey, it hey, in hey. that context and we get people that are surprised, really, we get people that want to fight back against the things we're saying in terms of how these women are acting on a, and on whose behalf. Yeah. It's like you do not understand how many generations went into the mind state Mm -hmm. that you confront when you ask a woman for her number mm -hmm. most of the time. That's what you're dealing with. A legacy of that. We grew up with those women. Those women in that video were, for many of us, depending on your age, those were our mothers or our sisters mm -hmm. generation right there. Yep. But, but listen to this shit, though. Boy, this is the, this is the killing part of this article, right? He, 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 he prognosticates. This is 79, right? He says, look, he predicts that as the number of female households rises and possibly becoming the majority of all black families by 2000, mm -hmm. right? of course it is now, okay? He says women will make all the decisions due to the absence of men. Mm -hmm. And he suggests that the absence of black men in families might be due to women making decisions, most of them causing men to desert the family as a form of masculine protest. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> I wonder, I, I wonder you know, how old that is, okay? I call 79. it a silent protest, yep. Yep, it was the black masculine's turn, right? Yes, sir. And the marriage rates had gone down starting in the mid 1960s. Mm -hmm. So even by the time he's talking about this, he's 15 years in mm -hmm. making these comments. I came to the same conclusion maybe six, seven years ago. Silent protest. Mm -hmm. But well, at, at this point, there's no place you're going to really sit in a class that's going to cover the history of Black America and talk about Black men silently protesting the state of the family. They just frame it as deadbeats. And that's in graduate coursework. Mm -hmm. So the deadbeat narrative is so well accepted, you're going to have to accept it in graduate school no matter how many black men themselves on the ground say, no, black men may have be actually been protesting something. Mm -hmm. They don't want to talk about that. Hey, yeah, but, but, but the black, white men will actually call it, a, call it a marriage strike, right? Protesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We can't. But, but check this shit out, though. This is the SYBM part. <laughs> this is some SYSBM shit in 79. Yes. Mm -hmm. He says, we... It's important for us to discuss the choices of middle class black men. There we go. When it comes to their partners, mm -hmm. who often opt for women with more traditional femininity. Yes. This includes turning to white women who may better fit their perceived model of femininity, 
which is why many of the brightest black men are involved in interracial marriage. <laughs> Hold on. And so, Gigi, was he a prophet or a blind squirrel? That motherfucker's a prophet. I, th I think you ought to listen to what they can say to you. What you ought to do? <laughs> <laughs> you know, what we're talking about is mm -hmm. the Manosphere circa 1980s. Mm-hmm. White boys got the game from black men. The Manosphere as an idea, brothers have been rolling with in various ways lo longer than the, this last decade. Mm -hmm. We didn't have a name for it. We obviously didn't have the internet. But notice how the ideas are still here. Mm -hmm. Same things we're talking about now, brothers were talking about then. And trust me, I met Passport Bros when I was a kid. I just didn't know what the shit was. There are some things that I agree with that he says. There are some things that I don't agree with. Like, the, the, the next thing he says is that, uh, and this is also Manosphere-ish. Okay. He says, there is going to be a significant challenge for women striving for career advancement because the aggressive achievement-driven traits that they need for a career make it difficult, almost impossible for them to attract and to keep a man. Do you hear a time bomb ticking? <laughs> modern, modern women, huh? Mm -hmm. He says, hey, that shit that you're doing in your job ain't going to work when you come back to the crib. Is he all awesome? that aggressive shit. I'm, I'm a PhD. Like, you know, Kevin Sanders used to play that shit all the time. I'm a PhD. <laughs> Because he also knew they were going to bring it home. Mm -hmm. You don't turn that off. That's why Kevin used to talk about nurses. Remember he used to talk about don't date nurses? Mm -hmm. <laughs> he said they will bring those behavioral traits home. Mm -hmm. But he also talked about that in the corporate space. In teachers as well, man. Watch out for teachers, man. Them motherfuckers, especially pe pe teachers who teach young people, mm -hmm. don't fuck with them, bro. No, I can't to, say. I, I, look. Trying to, try to mommy you, huh? Man, I had to, man, until, man, look. I am not a fucking kid, man. Mm -hmm. You can't fucking punish me into doing shit. There's, you can't give me a detention or put me on a fucking, like, a, a, a fucking, you know, a suspension. Mm -hmm. What the fuck is wrong with you bitches, man? Like, you can't. My mama can't punish me, motherfucker. <laughs> so why the fuck would I, you think you can punish me? This, like, this is the problem. Like, it's called compartmentalization. But but women have become accustomed to thinking that they can punish men. And the society supports this shit. You know what I'm saying? So it, to them, we're students or we're children or we're employees. Those are the frameworks that we see them using in the household. <laughs> but the, the, here's what I don't agree with. He, he talks about like there being a shortage of black men, which I don't. I know that... There's somewhat of a shortage because there's a, like a bigger ratio in some spaces. Uh, I get that. I understand that. And he talks about like, okay, there are more mortality rates for black men in the marriageable years. Homicide is amongst, you know, among the top causes. Uh, many black men face problems with drug addiction, incarceration, and unemployment. But I'm like, man, half of these bitches out here getting these niggas strung out on the dope. Do mm -hmm. fucking. That's like... Most niggas start fucking and, and getting high. It's, it's, it's like a, a, a synergy thing, a synergistic experience. You fucking, you get high. But it'd be a lot of women turning these guys out. It ain't just a man turning a woman out. Okay? Um, but he's like, well, there aren't enough good men to pick from. I'm like, nah, it's, it's some men out here to pick from. You just don't want them motherfuckers. Yeah. But he's like, well, this due to the fact that there aren't enough good men, it's understandable that the women are angry and all this kind of shit and defensive and manipulative based on their past abuse. I'm like, man, but all of this shit is 79 type thinking as it pertains to abuse and uh, violence statistics related to, you know, what takes place between or transpires between men and women. I just, I, I just think it's retro. 
it's retro and he did, he didn't know very much well, I mean, he's deceased now so he there's no way he can correct the record but this but that's the that's the same time period that that uh, curry is talking about in terms of the abuse rates that's the that's there's an irony there there's a strange overlap there but then the other part of it is the talking points he's using there uh, women are still using now we just yeah. heard rebecca lynn pope talking about you can't find no good men yeah even, yeah even though she married a, a pastor like you know she married a dude that she herself said she would never look twice at mm-hmm. and k williams same thing yeah but they'll mm-hmm. they'll tell you there's no good men left which is very reminiscent of what he's saying here mm-hmm. but the question really is you know how are you defining that and what are you doing to the dudes next to you even even on even on the other end, Kiki Palmer, right? And her yeah. baby daddy, right? I don't need him. I don't need a, a baby father. But to go, but to go back to Kevin, Kevin mm-hmm. would say that you 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 already met your husband, ma'am. Mm-hmm. You already met him, and you got rid of him a long time ago. You put him in the friend zone. You dissed him. You didn't give him your number. That was your mm-hmm. husband. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. And, but then finally, the author. Staples basically says, uh, and to some degree, I agree with this, but he says, look, don't blame these problems on black men. Mm-hmm. The, the yeah. imprisoned, the unemployed, the addicted, uh, because all this is is creating division and exacerbating sexual inequalities in the home and at the workplace, which benefits white people. Mm-hmm. Uh, and this is often overlooked as critiques of black men are issued mm-hmm. and he predicts that black women 79 will surpass black men in terms of occupation and income by the turn of the century by 2000 leaving black men in an uncertain future and here we are mm-hmm. especially if you factor the unemployed uh yeah. though, or, you know he's right yeah um, factor the incarcerated or the unemployed he's right yeah and so then miss wallace Michelle Wallace basically does the, the blame and the victim shit. Well, black men are really actually responsible for their own oppression. <laughs> and he Strange. says that's flat, that what he says that's flat out wrong. Strange how that works, right? When it's black women, they're not responsible for black men are responsible, right? Strange how right. that works. Yeah. So he says, according to Miss Wallace, black men are largely to blame for their own social circumstances. Mm-hmm. And she starts talking about personal responsibility Ooh. and suggests that black men passively allow life. And external forces such as white bureaucracy. This is the same argument this chick was using. It's the same argument that guess who else was using? Lucas. Yeah. Same stuff. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And and when she withdraws her comments or steps back from them, nobody remembers it. Mm -hmm. When Michelle Wallace would step back from her comments, it's it's not regarded by, by feminists or anybody else. Yeah, if I if I can offer an opinion, and this is just an opinion because I don't have any proof of this, basically, this is black women crying to white daddy that you you need to take us in because we have defective black men. They go to jail, they can't work, they can't support a family, they leave their they leave their kids, they're not good fathers, yada yada yada. We need a whole a good crop of, of, of different men, starting with white men. I mean, I mean, ultimately, this is the point at which like. An ideological line is being drawn in the sand Mm -hmm. and a racial sexual divide is being drawn in the Mm -hmm. sand Mm -hmm. because ultimately like what she's advocating for is that black women take care of themselves and leave the dusties alone. Mm -hmm. This is Cynthia G. Cynthia G. Yeah. I mean, this is the Cynthia G before Cynthia G. This Mm -hmm. is like the the prototype. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, no disrespect, but I mean, this is just it. Yeah. Like everything is here already. Yeah, in its nascent stages. Okay, yep. and you know, well, Staples is going to say this is like an individualistic viewpoint, and it's a neoconservative viewpoint, and it overlooks systemic features of capitalism, and other you know forces that contribute to black oppression. And he says, "Look, all you're doing is carving yourself, painting yourself into a fucking corner." As women, I mean, black women, because he says the identity of Black women can't be fulfilled in isolation from black men. You're not going to be able to achieve satisfaction with these kind of relationships that exist, be- strained relationships that exist between black women and black men. Anyway, he, and then he goes on to further say, uh, 
sexism and racism within the black community are actually, and I think Curry is somebody who contemporarily makes this case. The sexism and racism in the black community are derivative of larger socioeconomic uh, contradictions, right? Fostered by a capitalist order. And uh, it, it, we're not paying attention to the right things it is, is ultimately what's being said here. I mean, ultimately, uh, A lot of things have taken place and, you know, uh, you know, outsourcing the jobs, deindustrialization and shit like this. It was just at the beginning. But he poses it in terms of like black men moving from rural to urban life, the rise of materialistic neoliberal, you know, uh, middle class values. It's kind of bewildering to guys coming from the fucking country. Now, all of a sudden, they got to deal with all of these issues. Okay. <laughs> When, when have, when have uh, black men been able to actually practice sexism on black women? Anywhere well, in any time in history? No. Any time in history? No. No. Only on an individual level, but never a collective one. Not even on the individual level. No, I mean, individually, you know, you people can get out of pocket. I'm not going to claim that can't happen. The problem we've had is these feminists have framed individual situations and tried to make them a rationale for black male oppression. Mm -hmm. I used to notice in class when I would press students who would want to make those arguments, the, excuse, right. the definition of sexism to them was mm -hmm. their grandmother got hit by their grandpa. Uh, okay. they, they would individualize acts of sexism and make them collective. Mm -hmm. But when I would ask them about white men mm -hmm. and how white men have been able to express, you know, uh, uh, patriarchy, they could give me every institutional data point you can think of from real estate to number of CEOs. But when it came to black men, my father hit my mother once. Once, yeah. but but it's not sexist for the for your mother that you hit your hit your father, throw hot water know. on him. Or no, it's self defense. That's not it's self defense. Oh, okay. Even if she initiated and he never put hands on her, it's still yeah. self defense. And, and I'll say this: too. I was just talking to my 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 young cousin, right, about her mother, about her mother and father, right, and to this guy he had a uh, he had a southern woman. She's you know she's about thirty, and you had a you have a, um, a, a, a a patriarchal man from the Dominican Republic, right, having children together, right? And you know how, how, musti, uh, how machismo works uh, as far as uh, uh, Hispanic men, right? Okay? The Southern woman's not having it. She tried to put his head through a wall, okay? That's what's going on. Black women have never, ever, 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 ever uh, uh, not defended themselves against men, ever. <laughs> Never been the case. Well, yeah. yeah. So, so, so you know, look, look I'm, I'm not gonna hold because we at the three hour mark, and I don't yeah. want to hold y'all forever. You know what I'm saying? But like, like, look, we seen the the only thing I've tried to do is to demonstrate that like mm -hmm. the strained relationship between black men and women, yeah, has a source, and the source is something that was present during slavery. It was present during Reconstruction. Now, here's the thing. We would never have had Reconstruction if black men didn't put their fucking dicks on the chopping block and fight. It's a lot of black men that died fighting in the Civil War. But we don't even have, like, statues erected and edified for black men who basically put everything on the line in order to obtain freedom. Because that... The North wouldn't have won the war without black soldiers. True. Or, he just wouldn't or, have won it. it, or, it or, or, or the, or the uh, black slaves leaving, the uh, black male slaves leaving the plantation on, on the word of it, okay? Which took courage. It took courage, yeah. Go, go back and look at, uh, what is it, uh, uh, Emancipation by Will Smith, okay? But they keep calling us weak. Yeah. They keep calling us bitches. They keep calling us boys. They keep calling us nakers. They keep yeah. calling us dusties. Them dusty ass black men who were slaves mm -hmm. fought for freedom yeah. and secured it only to then be thrust back into terror and they had their backs turned on them by the North. And mm -hmm. white women who had husbands who lost, brothers who lost, mm -hmm. they erected all kind of fucking statues to them motherfuckers. Mm-hmm venerated them honored and lionized the losers 
and we were the winners and we still got no lionization. And to this day, the only thing the motherfuckers say is that you're a group of weak dusties and shit. You you niggas ain't you ain't up to snuff. You ain't you're not meeting up to my demands and standards. Be more like Harriet, right? Ain't one that is left asking the question like, what the fuck does a motherfucker have to do to make y'all man, like have any respect? And this is so this is so widespread that even this very show we had that same experience. This is, this, that's how cold this is. This very show, we had the same experience. So y'all can't, somebody can, nobody can come up here and tell me, oh, you guys are just imagining things. Because that's how they gaslight you. Oh, that's not true. That doesn't happen. Maybe that's just the women you know. You know, all these little tactics they use to dismiss what we're talking about. It happened in this very goddamn show. And then we, we bussies and shit. Like, think about, like, how I'm supposed to respond to somebody calling me a bussy. Like, it really is laughable, honestly. Uh, you, you bussies have been crying and blah, 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 like, bro. Hey, tell Junior, sit down, man. At the quiet. end of the day, I told you to tell the motherfucker, get out my face, bitch, and tell your nigga to come holler at me. Because <laughs> if I smack you, then he, then he going to come, like, with his, with his heart elevated, and I'm going to have to smack his ass up, too. <laughs> I told Junior to get some bass in his voice first. Man, come on, bro. At, at the end of the day, dog, you like you're dealing with guys here, man, who you're dealing with guys here, man. You don't know who the fuck you're talking to on the internet. I, I know you like to feel like you're cool and you, you, all this masking and shit going on, like mm-hmm. in, in the internet and in social media spaces. Man, it needs to stop, man. I, I wish they really did have like a setup where like men could bang it the fuck out in the octagon somewhere, man. <laughs> all this shit talking, all the motherfucking yelling and loud talking is unnecessary. I really do, man. But like, I, I you know, I personally, you know, I don't, I don't even feel like devolving into that bullshit because it's too, it's, it's juvenile. But the only thing I wanted to do is to clarify my statements and to let it be known. First and foremost, we were having a conversation about accountability and black women and the viewpoints and the ideas they have and whether or not their ideas will be modified by anything we say. <laughs> this is what we're having a conversation. And you got two married women who are basically saying niggas ain't shit. Niggas mm-hmm. need to be better. Niggas need to build me a home. Niggas need to break themselves and fucking like offer the world up to me. It's already been done for you. Mm-hmm. The price for freedom has already been played by black male blood. It's already been given up to you. Shit, like Jesus. You just, but the Jesus you worship is some white motherfucker somewhere. <laughs> when it's been a real black, it's real black men who really sacrificed their lives and put their fucking dicks on a chopping block so that your Negro little winch ass can be free. Yeah, so we, we continue to be black Jesus on a daily basis. And nobody, nobody thinks about, critically about the shit that they're talking about. And, and, look, and look, I'm just tired of Horatio Alger ideology and propaganda. I'm sick and tired of the whole notion that, you know, uh, anything that happens to you, you brought it on yourself. Mm-hmm. I'm tired of all this alpha conversations, all this alpha talk. It's man drag to me. I played Macho Man the other day from the Village People. That's what the shit sound like to me. Mm-hmm. I'm a Macho Man. I'm this. I'm a real man. Like man, come on, bro. You black in the United States, man. You really don't have that much clout. Yeah, I don't stop. give a fuck if you rich in America, man. And I don't care if you Jay Z. What what power does Jay Z have? He got billion dollars and shit. What and power he, does he have? And, and guess what happened? Is his, his sister in law tried to beat him up in the elevator. Man. <laughs> <laughs> God damn. <laughs> so much for respect at, at what what is it? Ten figures. Man. I'm telling motherfuckers, man. Look, Tiger Woods, a black man, white ass wife chased his ass around a motherfucking crib. Mm. That dude hit hit a fire hydrant near his house and some shit or some shit. And trying to escape that golf club was swinging at his head. Yeah, I guess I would too. <laughs> wow. 
Like, hold on. Now, nah, was he might have been fucking philandering? Yeah, but shit. Kennedy was philandering. I know his wife wasn't fucking with him like that. You don't even need to go that far. These women know it's out of pocket because if it was if it was acceptable that somebody should get beat down for cheating, mm -hmm. we wouldn't hear a word the moment a woman got beat down for doing the same thing. Mm -hmm. What did they tell you? That's a woman. Don't you shouldn't put hands on her no matter what she's done. Okay. But if he does it, it's grounds for him to damn near be killed. That's acceptable. Make that make sense, please. So, so <laughs> the, the only the only thing I'm saying is, come on, man. Let's let's be let's be real, man. Yes, it's black culture, concubine culture. It has to be. Mm -hmm. If it was a slave culture, we know it was. And you might not like to hear that. You might like to believe that you're like a real man and that, you know, like nothing bad can happen to you, but mm -hmm. get out of the virtual world and like, let's have a conversation about some of the shit that's really happened to you in your real life. I guarantee you, you're not untouched out here. You're not like batting at a thousand. I guarantee you. No one is. You know what the song back in the day, everybody plays the food. There's no exceptions to the rule. Mm -hmm. But now that there's this like, ideology out here that like you can avoid you can avoid any <laughs> you know corruption or any kind of maliciousness by just having the right attitude and being that nigga or that that man mm -hmm. come on man that shit is just it, it, every man falls there's no man who's undefeated even Tyson got his ass whipped <laughs> at some point Muhammad Ali might have been undefeated in the ring, but shit, that he got beat. George, George Foreman beat the shit out of him, and Joe Frazier too. Mm -hmm. Walking around with Parkinson's and shit, you know, not being able to really move, and your motory skills, you know, highly diminished. That's a hell to me. I'm just saying, nobody out here is undefeated. Nobody's undefeated, man. So we got to stop. The lies associated with manhood, man. I'm, all I can tell you is I'm in a fraternity. I done seen motherfuckers get broken. And anybody will break after certain amounts of pressure, man. That's why you need a team of people, man, to, to, to endure the kind of experiences that we've had. Yeah. Te a team working in conjunction with each other in order to defray the pathology and the maliciousness being directed in our direction. I mean, being hurled in our direction. So, And I think it's safe to say each of us have been trying to motivate black men to work with each other in, a, in alignment with what you're describing. But I get two types of black men that show up to every discussion we have where I'm trying to pull brothers together. One either wants to flex that he's more man, man than the next guy sitting next to him, or the other wants to, 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 you know, to argue that we need to stop doing this and defer to women because we're making them uncomfortable. Those are the two guys that show up at every discussion. Now, let me make something clear. I've never said that you shouldn't work diligently to improve your qualities or enhance your skills and to develop yourself into being the best version of yourself you can be. That's not what I'm, I'm, I'm saying here. I am saying, though, that, like, we are human. <laughs> okay? I'm not saying... You know, like, don't persevere. That's not the message. The message is, like, what kind of concept of manhood are you actually putting out there? The one that, like, that manhood is such that you're impenetrable, that you have no feelings, that you never take L's, that you never encounter disrespect, that everything opens up for you like you're Moses part in the Red Sea? Like, you know, like, like, like the, the ideology and the secret. You can use the law of attraction to bring anything you want to yourself. Come on, man. Yeah, it's alpha, this alpha talk, man. You know this uh, self determination, man. This uh, it's it it's 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 gotten into a, a more like religion than anything else. It's not practical. Mm. This alpha talk. It's man, dude. I, I done said, look, it's, I done been female. in fights. Yeah, I, I done been in fights and lost some. Mm -hmm. I've been in fights and won some. Yeah, but to argue like you. You've never suffered a loss. 
You've never been in pain. You've never had a difficulty to overcome. That's the that's the story of black life. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the, black men created like a whole genre of music talking about their troubles and struggles yeah. and shit. Yeah. You gotta remember John Henry dies in the end. Mm. Damn. He doesn't succeed. John Henry died in the end. So John Henry you waits to it, guess what's gonna happen to you in the end? gonna be you gonna work yourself to death and then not even enjoy life at all exactly and and the real world the the the, the uh steam uh engine keeps right on going right past you so look man look i i want y'all to make some closing comments if you can man i'm about to sign off from this man i'm getting tired and uh i don't want to look at my chat anymore <laughs> <laughs> no you don't <laughs> <laughs> Oh man! <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll go first, man. Uh, uh, one thing you did say about about this, man. This is proto SYSBM, right? In other words, basically, people ask me why SYSBM because your woman is not going to help you. Okay, mm. she's already said that you're on your own. All you got, you have to get it out the mud. All you have is you and your bootstraps, if you have boots. So mm. you might as well get used to it. Stop, stop trying to beg them to help you. They're not. Okay, they haven't in 50 years. In fact, they're trying trying to step on you and step over you to get what they need. That's the game is the game, is as they say in the wire. Yeah. Yeah. You wanna say something, Doc? Uh look, I'm just saying the only solution that I can see if you can use that term is um black men working with each other, actually being able to uh provide resources and and, and a network and a support framework for each other but at the end of the day you know this squabbling this beefing this fighting this chest thumping all of this shit we do to keep from actually building and working with one another is counterproductive and it's time to it's time to move to another level we got to have conversation we got to be able to move these resources we've been developing for the last number of years into a tangible plan where we can actually get some work done but the first thing we got to do in order to, to do that is to either stop trying to flex, out flex each other or prioritize any and everyone else but us. Those things have to start first, in my humble opinion. So I appreciate you inviting me, man. Thank you. Hey, thank you for uh, being here, man. I appreciate you, bro. Straight up. Uh, before I zone out, I do want to say this. And, uh, you know, I'm going to sign off. None of what we've discussed today, like I said before, is intended and I said this yesterday, it's intended to, you know, suggest that men should be weak or allow themselves to be subjected to abuse or exploitation. It's not what this is about. I expect for you to respect yourself, to assert your rights and boundaries, and to expect fair treatment from everybody you come into contact with, male or female, straight or gay. And I said yesterday, and I'll say it today again, most of the biological kingdom operates under some modified form of a tit-for-tat strategy. In particular, forgiving tit-for-tat, which means that you'll stand up for yourself when people do you some sort of wrong, and you're willing and ready to cooperate when other people are ready to reciprocate working together. But if they don't, fuck them. Cut them off. Okay? So... The alpha male myth and, and exploring it and talking about it is not about promoting passivity or victimhood or saying that you shouldn't develop yourself. It's just a call for understanding that leadership is more nuanced than just being something abstract like an alpha. And then, like, I said this earlier as well. Psychologists don't even have or utilize the language of alpha and beta and sigma. They don't even use those terms to talk about, excuse me, human personality. They don't refer to it. So why are you making reference to it? It's, it's not capturing the essence of how human beings behave and act and interact with each other. So strength is not just, you know, imagining yourself to be a leader it actually means that you have to foster cooperation and you got to give respect in order to receive it. 
it, it's team building. That's how can you ha be a leader if you're not part of a team to begin with, and you don't care about the outcomes that your team is subjected to, whether it be for good or bad. So, having said all that, man, keep your heads up, man. Be peaceful. Be perseverant and resilient. And uh, have some fun, man. You only live one life, man. So, I holler at y'all, man. Y'all be peaceful in this PC, man. Be easy, breezy. <laughs> holler at y'all.